Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I would like to welcome you all to the Denali Borough Assembly meeting on Wednesday, January 12th. Uh, recording is now happening, so we can officially start. Cool. I already said my welcomes. <clears throat> um, so we're going to start our meeting tonight with a public hearing and to provide a public comment. You can either call in the borough office here at 907-683-1332, or you can join us via Zoom on the website that is listed at the Denali Borough webpage, and you can mic yourself in with video and such that way if you choose. Uh, for tonight's public hearing, however, we do have no um, items to consider, so we will close the public hearing and we'll move on to the regular meeting. Um, of which I would like to call to order at this time. Um, would the clerk please call the roll? Colin Strait? Here. David Alexander? Here. Joe Chatfield? Jeff Stanger? Here. Dominic Canelli? Here. Lisa Miner? Eileen Holmes, Chris Zapon, here. Jared Zimmerman, there is a quorum. I move to excuse the absent members. Second. It has um, been so moved to excuse our absent assembly members. Is there uh, any objection to the excusal? Hearing none, members are so excused. That brings us to the public comments section of this meeting. During this section of the agenda, the assembly, the assembly will receive comments from the public when providing a comment, either in person here or virtually. Please provide your full name and limit your testimony to about three minutes per person. Um, here in the building, is there a camera for them? We have a few um, community members who have would like to say something. So, Mr. Haugen, can you raise your yeah. hand first? Hey, thanks. So, I'll just stay seated just because it's in line there. So, <laughs> yeah, Eric Haugen here in Healy. Um, I'm here to support or ask the Assembly to support Resolution 2205, which is the Ice Rink Outdoor Rec Facilities Improvements. Um, I've been with the hockey program since 2008, so I've been part of it for quite a while, you know, and you see all this weather that happens a lot. And so, um, I'm gonna expound on that. So the, the grant basically is travel tourism outdoor rec programs, targets communities that rely on travel tourism and outdoor rec. So I'm sure everybody's read that. And you know we have the coal mine here, but there's that other segment, which is the park. So we have these emerging VRBOs, which is becoming a bigger thing. The Airbnbs, our hotels, we've got another restaurant now. So, you know, things are starting to grow. Um, with this, you know, targeting that grant where it's travel tourism outdoor rec programs, uh, the borough and the park has talked a long time about shoulder season and off season and how can we actually develop economic um, programs or, you know, target things that would bring tourists in, not just the busload that swipes through, but actually, you know, maybe stays in the community and spend some money here. Mm -hmm. So um, being that we've talked about it as a borough for a long time, I think this uh, grant that we're seeking for the ice rink improvements and outdoor um, rec is really targeted perfectly for this. Um, one way, you know, speaking from a hockey standpoint, is that uh, we would like to do more tournaments down here and bring people from Fairbanks, from Delta, from Kenai, from Anchorage, you know, and, and get those people to come here and play tournaments here. We've tried unsuccessfully many times. In fact, we've tried one here in December, you know, and just weather beat us out and uh, we weren't able to pull it off. But if we are able to do things like that, um, we could bring more economic development into the community, right? We get these teams of you know, 14 to 20 kids. And then you think about all the parents that are with that and siblings and everything else. And if they stay overnight for a weekend tournament, we're trying to do games on a Friday and a Saturday and possibly a Sunday. Well, what does that turn into? More Airbnbs, more VRBOs. Um, our grocery stores get more business. Our three restaurants are getting more business. So I think it targets perfectly with that. Um, you know, I, I think about the one thing mainly in my realm, where which is the cover that we are trying to get over the rink. 
and how much benefit that would do in supporting these tournaments to go on. Because if we get that wicked snowstorm like we just had, boom, you know, you're roasted, you're out. It, we could have saved the ice possibly um, and not have had it just go out completely with that weird storm because we wouldn't have all that snow that created the slush and then we lost, you know, ice times. Um, so, you know, a cover would be just a great support for that. We were just recently in Delta, and I'm running out of my three minutes, but we were just recently in Delta. They have um, a covered rink, and it's actually walled, but it's not heated. And it was howling out there, and I don't think we would have played were it not for the facility they had. So this cover really is a start. So I know there's other things involved in the grant that we're seeking for, it, but just speaking from a coach's standpoint, the cover, the games that we could bring would uh, be amazing. And then along with that, what are the hidden benefits that we get, not just the economic development, but it's not just hockey that uses the rink. We go down there a lot at one in the afternoon, you know, after we do homeschool and there's all kinds of people down there skating. So think about that and then piggyback that onto tourists that come down. And if we have a bunch of skates that people just check out for free and wanted to try ice skating, well, here's a covered rink now to do it. So anyways, all that to say, $5 donation, $5 donation to the Healy yeah. Hockey Program would be amazing. But anyways, all that to say for the assembly, just I, I would hope that you would support it because I think it does have um, benefits that target what the grant is for. So mm -hmm. with that, I'm not going to stay too long. I'll, I'm going to stay with Kathy for a second, but then I got practice right here at 645. So thank awesome. you guys for the time. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Any questions for Mr. Haugen before he goes? Uh, what, what are the improvements besides the, the roof? I'm going to let quickly. Kathy speak to that because she okay. knows it better than I do. Okay. Tell all me. right. Anybody else virtually? Any questions? Hearing none, uh, our other community member is Healy Hockey President Kathy Madela. I assume to speak on similar items. Yes, it's pretty much exactly the same, which is great. We're on the same page. <laughs> um, I'm here to support um, or to seek your support for resolution, resolution 2205 for the Rink Improvements Project. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being on the board and, um, and dedicating your time. It's obviously appreciated. Um, and, you know, now being on the board for Healy Hockey, I even more appreciate somebody being on the board and dedicating their time to it because I know how much effort it takes and how much it takes from your uh, personal life. So um, thank you for that. As most of you know, covering the rink in any fashion has been a long time dream for a lot of residents um, in the area. It would bring a level of predictability that would allow us to host events, um, including tournaments that would bring more people into the in during the winter months. Um, other opportunities that it could provide is maybe other other ice sports such as curling or figure skating um, and things like that where the ice needs to be in more pristine condition than we can maintain it currently with our outdoor rink. Um, that would you know bring in more people as well um, and more opportunities. Um, you know the increased number of people like Eric said would just bring in um, more opportunities for the hotels and the Airbnbs and um, all of the current businesses, but also open up opportunities for other businesses to move into the area. Um, and the park would also benefit from that in their efforts and increase winter month um, recreation. Um, some of the challenges that it would solve is, um, you know, we currently face the, the elements. Um, every day we pretty much are like, what's the ice doing? Are we able to skate today? Is there too much snow on the ice? Is there four inches of slush that we need to plow off? I don't know if you all saw that video, but we spent a good portion of the day taking care of that awful storm with the slush underneath it because what was left, um, if it had frozen, we wouldn't have a puck strip left because there was so much of it. Mm -hmm. So we've spent many, many um, backbreaking hours keeping our ice clear and trying to keep it um, going for the youth sports in the area. That being said, that portion of it really is what hinders us from trying to put on tournaments. It takes a, a great amount of effort um, and money to put on tournaments um, internally. And we just can't spend that time, money um, and effort on trying to put together tournaments that may not happen because of the elements. So, um, so we're just asking that you guys consider um, approving that co-application process to help us get this off the ground and, and try to improve so that we can um, help bring more people into the area. That's all I have for you. Just need her three minutes. <laughs> Did I? I don't know. Well, he covered most of it, so I'm good. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so thank you for your comment, um, Kathy or Miss Madela. Uh, is there any questions for the Healy Hockey Bundle now that they've given us their whole spiel? What what, what are the besides the roof? What are the hmm. intended improvements? Yeah. So um, we have a couple of ideas with it. So there's the bare bones, which I consider having just a roof, similar mm -hmm. to what you see in Willow and Talkeetna. 
we looked at the cost of those and it, to put one here, it looks like it'd probably be in the $800,000 range to do that. Um, mm -hmm. That wouldn't protect us from the wind um, and from the intense swings in temperature with the wind. So ideally what we would actually seek is um, at least a shell building or a facility similar to the Big Lake Recreation Center. They call it a rec center, but it's just a rink. Um, it's unheated. There's no uh, refrigeration in the slab for, for the ice. It's just like the shell building. And then it has a smaller heated area that has the locker rooms and the entry area and office space. Um, I think that that would be ideal, but right now we're that's dependent upon the 20% match that we're able to get that this grant requires. So we're talking to our sponsors right now to see if we can pull out a 20% match on our ideal um, you know, form with that. And if we can't, then we'll go for the cover and we'll get the improvements that we can get. I think that we're, um, you know, some of, some of the ideas that we've been putting around, we have um, the support from Mr. Isabelli. Um, we have a couple of Fairbanks youth organizations that are willing to help us get Rasmussen funds mm -hmm. to help with that 20% match. Um, and I know that there's a lot of local folks as well that want to see this happen. So I, I optimistically don't foresee an issue with trying to make that match, but I do want to make sure that, that we have that obviously in place because we can't apply without it. That's, that's the ideal location. Um, <laughs> any, don't give any, anybody else virtually before I, I go. Okay, hearing none. Uh, so, no, thank you. I do have another public comment. I, not on this topic. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, so the, the Lions Club of Big Lake built that building. Correct. So to take my assembly member hat off and put the other one on, um, we should get in contact about getting a hold of the, the funding there. Yeah. Teresa's on it because she's a rock star. Yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> anyway, um, the other one I had was what about doing like a, a, an enclosed like bleacher, particularly on the south end, mm -hmm. if that could maybe go into this bones option for you guys. I would think that if we could block the primary heat, which is that south wind going there, um, that might that might help. Like a semi. Just even if we can't get it covered, but we can get yeah. the bleachers and something, keep the snow out of the way. Right. Um, as a hockey player, I'm obviously biased about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> very cool. Uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to come always. Um, yeah. And so we have one more public comment, is what I was informed of. Yeah. Okay. Is it so apparently the link on the calendar isn't working right? So I'm trying to oh 10 4. Okay. As we go. Do we um, want to proceed and suspend rules or do you think we should take the comment now? That's okay. Both both okay. people that let me know it wasn't working um use the link on the agenda. Okay, great. We're able to get in. So perfect. Well, welcome. So I'll read this and then I'll go um, update the calendar. Yes, ma'am. Um so this is from um the Govins, James uh, Tools and James and Susan Govin. Um, says, Dear Borough Assembly, we wish everyone a happy and productive new year and thank each of you for your commitment to the borough and its residents. As we look ahead to the upcoming 2022, 2022 tourism season, we would like to know if and how the borough will be implementing the land use fee of $5 per unit, parentheses, ATV, horse buggy, et cetera. Um, this commercial land use fee for borough land use was not implemented in the 2021 tourist season. And the borough is missing out on a potential on a potentially significant revenue stream, as well as ability to improve trail conditions and public safety. Safety, we would like to know. One, is the borough planning to collect these fees in 2022? If not, what are the next steps in order to do so? Number two, has the borough informed the commercial operators about these fees? Number three, registration and fee collection process. Will it be similar to the overnight accommodation tax in that businesses must register and pay fees quarterly? Will commercial users have to register the number of units, ATVs, horse buggies, et cetera, they plan to use on borough land? Will the borough require a map of borough land used by commercial operators? What will the audit process? What will be the audit process? And then number four, how will the fees be used? Will they go on the general fund or will they be set aside to maintain and improve the impacted trails and roads? The residents of the Otto Lake Dry Creek um, area have been 
informing and educating the borough assembly <laughs> and the planning commission about the impacts of seasonal commercial uses and abuses of borough land for nearly eight years and the implement implementation of the land use fee is a forward step in addressing these issues. Thank you, Susan and James Scott. So I have it in writing and that will be part of the minutes. <clears throat> um, may I see the right? Oh, sure. Anybody on the assembly comments and response? I, I would assume they're the ones who are tuning in. Uh, Mayor, can you answer a question for me about the fee schedule as part of this? Um, I know that we have the numbers as, you know, we have a fee schedule, but are we at the point where we don't have like question whatever for registration, collection processes? Like, could you maybe elaborate on where we are there and sure. start with that? Yeah, there have been additional steps necessary to get to implementation of the commercial use permit um, structure that we did put in place with the rewrite of Title IV. And yeah, some of those questions are, um, are, are, are good questions that are things that we continue to um, refine and, and hone in on, things like how will those fees be used? It's not spelled out in Title IV rewrite. Um, are we planning on taking on maintenance of trails, which those trails, which we have never done, would those fees go into um, public, the, the parks and rec fund and could potentially be used in other areas as well? Those are, are questions that we are considering. And- But and we're, we're not currently collecting fees. We're not currently collecting fees. We and- We don't um, currently have the mechanism to help collect them. So that we don't want to. Right. Clarification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's, that's okay. Um, in fact, um, staff has done some research in how other municipalities implement commercial use fees. And um, have, we've learned quite a bit and there's some good recommendations. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've had some hurdles to get over, um, including you know, the land use plan and, um, and now that's behind us, but also, um, um, what were the other ones? Um, and I've been working with Marsha and Allison Johnson, our administrative aide has done a lot of good research this winter on those other, um, other permit structures. And we've got some, we've got some uh, potential ways forward. But the $5 a horse that we came up with uh, and buggy or whatever, or whatever type of vehicle, um, that is not a, a, a structure that's used in other areas. And in talking with some of the, um, the operators that a, a flat fee or more of a, uh, an easier to administer kind of program of, of um, Maybe reporting after the season; those those are things rather than reporting in the middle of the season. Um, how that all works out; those questions that the Galvin's asked are things that we are working on. Those those specifics. Um, okay, thank you. I do have a follow up. Um, one of the things that is left out of this um, statement and addressing these things is obviously the land use uh, plan that we, we developed, I look at these two because they were there, no offense. Yeah. Uh, that took us three three wow. years to do from start to, from start to finish. It took us three years. And part of what made it take that long was the fact that we thoroughly researched, got the feedback again and again, adapted to the feedback again and again similar to the way that we did the naming for the streets. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very thorough process, the way that we do implement change here. And that takes time. And I understand being frustrated about it taking time, but the other real big elephant in this room for me personally is um, COVID happened and it changed everything that the borough is expected to stay on top of, stay in line with, be abreast with the funding coming down the pipe, uh, we've we've gone and gotten a couple of new employees or we're working on it to help administratively, right? But, and I don't say this 
to sound rude, but the trails in the time that we're in right now, not to say it's not a priority, but I feel like it might not be the highest priority for us to get through what's happening right now. The borough is at an all-time low financially. We can not expect a lot of money, hoping for another season. Um, I understand that they want to keep us involved, but I'm having a harder and harder time with some of the language that's being chosen here. And I'm going to say that now, and that's it. And I do hope that we can find our ways forward. I do know and trust that the borough is working forward to continue to advance revenue. So thank you for your comment, Mr. and Mrs. Govin. I look forward to your return. Um, are there any other comments that have come since we started this? I'd like to say something in relation to that. Proposal. Okay, go ahead. go ahead, Mr. Stanger. I think the biggest red flag for me on this is the mention of maintenance, trail maintenance. Um, Thank you. That could be just as expensive as a road. And then you got to think about liability. If the trail goes down and somebody a horse breaks its leg or somebody falls off their wheeler and they claim it's because of the trail conditions that could make us liable. And I'd be really concerned about taking on that scope. Especially without uh, prior practice or any kind of plan. I mean, it's, it's a big undertaking. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's a big project and it took us three years to get the groundwork for starting this project. I, I would just like to, you know, help everybody kind of get an idea for what kind of time goes into making a new fee for a place that's not used to paying very many. I mean, I'm sure there are several who could attest to when the bed tax happened and this would, you know, that didn't go over well for a little while. So it's just doing it right the first time takes time. And that's important to us as a collective, I would say. And if I'm incorrect in saying that, please correct me now. Um, Mrs. Renshaw, did you confirm or deny another comment? No comments. Okay. So with that, we will close our public comment section. And I would look for, hey, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank appreciate you for sticking it, it out. Appreciate you. Uh, good luck with your uh, application. Thank you. Yeah. Working hard, there's a lot of paperwork. Yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, but good luck and let me know. We need some brains. Uh, okay, so now I will look to approve tonight's agenda. I move to approve tonight's agenda. Thank you. Second it. Okay, it has been moved. Are there any um, uh, amendments to the agenda? One thing I'd like to put in there, if we could do the Pledge of Allegiance. It's not in there. We did that, we're supposed to do that right now. Excuse us. It's been the rules to uh, pledge our flag and our great nation. Mr. Mayor, if you'd be so kind. Gladly. Get the clerk Okay. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States of America and, and to, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Talon, for catching that. Who didn't put that? It's not, it's not written on this thing ever, is it? That's a, that's a me thing. That's a me thing. Dang it. I was, I practiced. That's why I figured I'd do it right there. I appreciate it. Okay. So before we actually approve with vote, is there any? Disconnected here? I don't think so. Or is it done out? Black, okay. Uh, is is Mrs. I, I think you'll come back on. Is Mrs. Geick on the phone with us tonight at all? Yeah. She is, yeah. Okay, so I would entertain a motion to move her to before reports. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, I need, I'll second that. I can't make it. Oh, so. dang it. Um, like to move our, uh, what is it, uh, communication and appearance requests to before the reports. Second it. Okay, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm supposed to talk now. I forget. <laughs> uh, okay. So it has been moved. That takes us to uh, the approval of last month's meeting minutes. Yes. 
We need to approve that. Amendment. Oh, I mean, I need to have a vote by show of hands or a roll. Approve the amended agenda. Oh, to approve. Oh, yeah. we did that. No. Oh, we didn't. We, okay. We, we amended it, but we haven't approved it. Um, all those in favor of the um, amended agenda? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. We got you, Jeff. Got you, buddy. Uh, okay, so that moves us to the approval of the minutes from December 8th, last month's meeting. I move to approve the minutes of the December 8th meeting. I second it. Okay, it has been moved and seconded, moved by Mr. Shreve. See, I'm warming up. And then seconded. Um, any discussion on the minutes, corrections, typos, anything? Hearing none, I will take a vote on approval of last month's minutes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Okay. Um, and that will take us to our communications from Ms. Lori Gag. Sorry if I said that wrong. You're up. Good evening. Does any does everyone have copies of the financial statements with them or or have them available? Are they on your screen that you could maybe share? Uh, no, I don't have them. I think, okay, nope, nope, you're good. I got mine. Okay, I could probably get them if we wanted to, but. Oh no, you were I, fine. I got I just, This is the okay. part that blew away. <laughs> okay. <This is> big <laughs> one? <laughs> it's a big one. I know yeah. it's a rather, it's a rather large report, um, 85 pages, so. Um, I'll probably skip over some of the parts. There's, there's a lot of, um, in your financial statements, there's a lot of required notes for things like um, uh, PERS pension and OPEB. I mean, there's probably 10 or 15 pages of those. So kind of what I thought I would go over is, you know, the presentation of the auditor's report and your financial statements. And then the, the notes that I think are, are most important to the assembly. I mean, if you have questions about, you know, PERS and TERS and, and everything we can we can address those, but um, what also makes it um, a significant report is that we include information um, regarding the school district in your notes. So it, that's part of the reason why um, it's a big report. This year we also had for the first time um, the Denali Borough was required to have a federal single audit, and so I will go over um, that. Uh, portion of the audit. That's something. That's something new. If you receive federal funds in, ex in excess of seven hundred fifty thousand, you're required to have an additional layer of a compliance audit uh, for those federal funds. And of course, with your CARES funds, that puts you into that category. In the past, you've had state, you know, state single audit where you've gotten some funds for some large projects, sometimes for the school buildings or sometimes for a fire engine or things like that. So you've had state single audits in the past. Uh, but not a federal one. So first I'll go over the audit report that starts on page, actually what we call, I don't believe it, it page one. And this is actually Alliance, which I'm part of Alliance CPAs in Fairbanks. And that's actually our part of, the, of this whole packet. The rest is really your management's report to you. And this is the independent auditor's report, which we issued on December 29th. And like it says, management's responsibility, your management is responsible for the financial statements, for the numbers, um, for everything that's posted. We assist them with preparing it, but there it's actually their responsibility. Our responsibility is to an express an opinion on these financial statements. And so um, we did not audit the financial statements of the Denali Rural School District, although we include some of their numbers, we depend on their, um, their borough auditors, which they've already discussed in uh, before, their, the results of their audit. So we depend on the on the results of their uh, the information that they furnish us to us as it relates to the Denali borough. And an audit involves we perform procedures on all kinds of things. We you know everything from cash to your revenues. We look at your receivables. We look at all different kinds of things in order to um, to issue our opinion. And we believe that we have sufficient evidence to uh, obtain and, and offer our opinion. And in our opinion, based on our audit report and the report of the other auditors for the school district, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects. 
the respective financial position of the governmental activities, the business type activities, um, your component unit, the major funds and the re uh, aggregate remaining fund information. What this means is that this is an unmodified opinion. It's, it used to be um, defined as a clean opinion. You might, you might've heard of a clean opinion before. It's an unmodified opinion. So that's the highest level of opinion that an auditor can give. And then we also report on some other things where some, there's some information that's required in your statements, budgetary comparison for your general fund, uh, pension and OPEB as, as I reported, pension and OPEB information. Um, now your management did not present this year the management's discussion and analysis, which is a very um, interesting part. It's written entirely by your management and it kind of describes where you are in your current um, current position and some information about the future. It's really, you know, it's really descriptive. And of course, with COVID and, you know, you, you lost your treasurer halfway, you know, right at, at audit time, um, management was unable to, um, to do this management discussion analysis this year. But our opinion on the financial statements is not affected by that missing information. We also issued on uh, this date our, we issue a, a separate report that which we'll talk about when we, when we come to the single audit part that talks about your internal control. We test your internal control and our tests of your compliance with laws, regulations, contracts, and grant agreements. So that was issued on December 29th. Okay. Now we'll go into the financial statements. Um, on page seven, it's called your statement of net position. This is really a presentation of the entire borough as if, it, as if it were a business. So that means it has your, your capital assets, your debt, any debt that you have. Now debt that you have is not, is not what you, you know, when you would normally think of as debt, it's your pension, purse pension liability, it's your estimated liability for your landfill closure is your primary um, debt. But this, this does present all your cash. You can see that you had, uh, it divides into governmental activities and business type activities. The business, your business type activities are your solid waste and your land enterprise funds. Governmental activities cover everything else, including your general fund, your permanent fund, um, any other major funds that we have. Like this year, there was a CARES, CARES fund was a major fund. So this shows that you know you, you have a good, at the end of the year, you still had 5 million. Well, this is as of a point in time. So this is as of June 30, 2021. Um, you had 5,620 in your total cash and cash equity investments, 7,505,000. ,005, and you can see you have a large capital, uh, capital assets. These include, the majority of that is the school buildings. Liabilities, you know, you have your basic um, accounts payables and your accrued payroll. Um, you have some grant advances, which means that, and unearned revenue. These are funds that you receive from the federal government in, in advance that you will spend in 2022. One of those, the 405,000 is your annual PILT that you receive payment in lieu of taxes that you receive. And you can see you had, do have 978,000 is your, is your portion of the state, of uh, the entire state's liability for PERS. And this is based on an actuarial report that was um, done in, as of June 19, rolled forward to June 20, and then reported by us in June 20, June of 21. And your lab estimated liability at this point in time, June 30 is 916,000. This is for the landfill closure and post-closure care costs. And we have a note that described that talks a little bit more of that and I'll go over that. The bottom part is your net position. So it's, it's your excess of your assets and liabilities. And you can see the majority of it is your investment in your capital assets, but you do have your permanent, uh, permanent fund investment of 3,780 and you always, and you forward fund, which means that you reserve out of your fund balance, the your anticipated expenditures for FY22. So that is 4,727,000. And then you still have re unrestricted of 3,339,000 divided between governmental activities and, the and business type activities. And then the right-hand column is a, is a high level presentation of the school district. The next page is meant to be viewed. So it's a little hard to view 
on paper, but it's meant to be viewed as two pages side by side. It shows your statement of activities, which is like your profit and loss for your business, your government as a whole. So it includes all expenditures, including any, any, um, any uh, expenses that were done to adjust your um, liability, your OPED liability, your landfill liability. And it shows your general revenues, which is of course your taxes, your overnight accommodation taxes, your severance taxes. Um, you did have, and we'll talk about it more when we come to the permanent fund, you had ex ex some good investment earnings this year of 859,000. Um, expenses, you have your govern governance and the school district, your school district match for the, and your general government expenses. Page nine is a presentation of your governmental funds. Now we have the business funds and the governmental funds. So this is actually a presentation of your general fund, permanent fund, capital projects, CARES fund, American rescue plan fund, and your other governmentals, which are your smaller, the smaller non-major funds, what we call them non-major, which are your grant funds. Like for example, your emergency performance uh, management grant, um, some of the MOAs that you had, your FEMA grant. So those are all included in this other governmental fund. So these are your assets as of June 30. Um, it basically follows along with the other presentation. However, it does not, a governmental presentation like this does not include PERS liability. It does not include capital assets. So there's no depreciation expense or any of that kind of stuff in governmental presentation. But you do, we are showing a, in the general fund, um, your subsequent year expenditures as a commitment. And then there's some smaller assignments that the assembly has decided over time. You have your parks and recreation account, emergency re response apparatus and a disaster contingency. So unassigned in the general fund at June 30 was a million 29. The permanent fund, permanent investment fund, what we, have, what we do on that one, what you do is that you have your permanent investment and then you're allowed each year by your code to take up to half, one half a percent of the earnings for that year and appropriate that for into the general fund for use. Uh, this year, there was 59,000, only 59,000 because the earnings were down in uh, FY20. And that money was transferred to the general fund and then to parks and recreation. So it's, it's up to then to the assembly to decide what, if they want to um, appropriate the entire amount that's set aside or and what projects they do want to uh, do there. For capital projects, you've got, um, you've got some money set aside. You've got 854,000 set aside for major school maintenance and then other pro capital projects, 400,000. Now the CARES Act, there was at the end of June 30, there was some cash still remain to be spent. So that's the 120,000 that's showing there. And your American Rescue Plan Fund, you had received funds um, toward the end of the fiscal year and had not spent them. So those will be funds that'll be spent in the current year. Now, let's see, this is a reconciliation. Let's go to page 11, actually shows your statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance for your governmental funds. And some interesting things in here is that um, in your general fund, your taxes, which has always been a large component, you know, which includes your overnight accommodation, and now also would include uh, marijuana and alcohol, but that's always been a very, you know, a large portion. It still is a large portion, but it's always been um, a large portion of the revenue of the general fund. This year, it was only 1,190,000. That includes severance taxes also. And for comparison, if you you know if you think about it before the uh, before the pandemic, before COVID nineteen in FY nineteen, which is not that long ago, your taxes uh, reported on this statement were four million two hundred fifteen thousand. So you can see that definitely a extreme drop in your um, taxes. Um, you still had some intergovernmental some investments smaller investment earnings in the, in the general fund. The general fund is primarily um, certificates of deposit, but in the permanent fund, all your investment earnings, and this includes any kind of, a, any kind of your code has any kind of income. So it's interest, dividends, realize, you know, anything is, was 848,000. And of that uh, you can 
um, you can appropriate up to one half of that to use in the general fund during this next year. Um, another large account uh, that you had this year, you had 3,583,000 in revenue and expenditures for the CARES Act. So that's something that you won't see in a long, you know, in a, in a, in a over, you know, occurring probably never, never again. I don't know that, but the chances of seeing that amount of funds come in for a CARES Act like that is, is probably pretty small. Now, I know, I understand there'll be American Rescue Plan um, revenue and expenditures in this current year, but but that was a very that was a large amount of money that funds that were spent in the, the borough this year. Okay, let's see. Page thirteen is what I talked about your proprietary funds. So this is your solid waste and land management funds. Um, they do still have uh, some good cash equity. Your solid waste also has uh, some investments, and I'll talk about those. Those are basically CDs, some CDs set aside for your um, uh, landfill closure. They do have some restricted cash that's also set aside. That is um, some funds set aside for the landfill closure. And that column that does show the estimated liability, if this is at a moment in time, June 30, there was 916,000 um, estimated liability um, as of June 30, 2021. And then you do have, for both funds, you do have some uh, your, the portion that we've that has been allotted to the business type funds, and it's based. We base the we allocate the the purse pension based on salary. So, so there is a portion that goes in the business type funds. Now, there's a net total net position still in the solid waste of one million seven, and the land management has five hundred and seven thousand of net assets. Primarily, the a lot of the net investment and capital assets for the solid waste is, is in your equipment, your landfill, um, your buildings, your equipment there. The next page is the statement of revenue. So it's it's your basically your profit and loss for the um, for the business type enterprise funds. And this year there was charges for service for solid waste of three hundred forty three thousand. And if you compare that to 2019, it was 554,000. So that's a significant um, decrease there due to, to the hotels not being open and just generally not, um, not being the charges for service for that landfill as there was in the past. Of course, although you know the revenue is down, expenses are still, because your primary uh, expenses, salaries and wages. So some of that you know, does not de decrease just because your, your revenues are down. So um, those are some of your primary expenses. You had uh, wages and benefits. And then you also, um, even though it's non, it's, it's what we consider a non-cash expense, we do increase, in, increase that liability each year. So uh, for, the, for the landfill closure, each year as you go forward, you increase, the liability increases. Um, and there's also in a, in a in this type of, of, of an account, the proprietary funds uh, function the same as a business, so there is depreciation too. So there was a depreciation in that solid waste of 137,000 due to the equipment and building, which is also what we consider to be in a non-cash expense. However, on for financial reporting, it is here. So you had net, you know, a net loss in those two, in those two of 342,000 in your solid waste and 147,000. Um, change in net position, that loss, change in net position of 147,000 for your land manager. Your land management or land enterprise fund does not generate um, extensive amounts of income, but it's an important part of your, of your borough functioning, but does not, um, it's basically built on land sales. So there's not a, a tremendous amount of uh, income generated there. Um, let's see, we'll go to page 16. Um, this describes your relationship with the Denali um, Borough School District and that they have their, they're governed by an independently elected board, but you're accountable because the government assembly approves the local contribution and also levies taxes if necessary and would be responsible for providing local funds for operations. So they're considered a component unit, although they are, they're not blended into your totals, they're presented entirely separate and they have their own set of financial statements and their own audit. Page 
Page 17 describes your different kinds of funds, your general fund, which is your primary operating account, your permanent investment fund, um, capital projects where you track the revenue and expenditures for major, major repair of borough buildings, or which includes school buildings. So if you had any major projects this year, there was very little activity. In fact, the only um, income and expense in that account was uh, some interest. So there was very little capital projects activity this year. The CARES Act is also tracking the revenue and expenditures of the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan fund. And then you also have in your, as we discussed, you have your solid waste enterprise fund and your land management enterprise fund. Let's see. On page 18, at the very last paragraph, we talk about that last year there was 59,000 that was appropriated from income earned the previous year. And that money was transferred to the general fund and then transferred to the parks and recreation account. Um, page 19 and your capital assets. At this time, you're capitalizing um, anything that is that you purchase, which is $500 or more. So um, when you capitalize it, you're removing expense and depreciating that over the life of the asset. Page 20 shows the life of your, um, the lives of your assets. The, the, of course, the longest one is 70 to 80 years for your school buildings. And that's the largest part of your, um, of your capital assets is your school buildings, the highest value. Long-term debt, like we, I described, you really don't have long-term debt. Long-term debt, we would normally consider to be uh, bonds or things like that that you have, but you don't really have any of that, but you do have responsibility for your purse pension and your landfill closure. Yes. Page 22, we talk about your revenue expenditures and expenses. And we talk about that your overnight accommodation taxes represent approximately 50% of your borough's general fund revenue in FY21. And that's been, that's down from what, you know, in previous years. And that this year you had about 54,000 in severance taxes, which that remained about the same. And this year you also began collecting the, but not to, Jan, since January 1st of 2021, you began collecting the alcohol and marijuana taxes. And that generated 112,000 in those six months. Page 24 um, shows the different cash that's in different, you have cash in all different functions from your uh, major school maintenance reserve to your general fund, your general fund and a, and a repurchase agreement, which is like a sweep from the general fund. So those two are actually your general fund. So the majority of your funds are in your general fund checking and your general fund repurchase agreement. And then also in your major school uh, maintenance reserve, you have 883,000 set aside. And your emergency response um, apparatus fund checking has 261,000 at this point. Capital projects also has 438,000. And so we're also showing then the cash breakdown between the different accounts for the business type activities. And then in addition, you have 173,000, which is not showing in these two, these two totals, which is restricted for uh, future landfill closure expenses. On page 25, it gives a breakdown of what type of investments you have. And so by your, um, code, you can only have certain types of investments. Right now, what you have in the general fund are certificates of deposits. These are various certificates of deposits spread out um, across the country to try to, to attempt to, most of them are 250,000 or less. Most of them are right around 250,000 so that they're FDIC insured. In the permanent fund, permanent investment, you have mutual funds and certificates of deposit. And then you have in the solid waste fund, you do have a certificate of deposit, uh, one for landfill closure, a certificate of deposit for the solid waste equipment reserve, which you always maintain. And then another one, 154,000 for operations. Land management fund in the past has had a certificate of deposit, but that was transferred, closed and transferred to land management savings in FY21. And then the general fund has certificates of deposit for that two million seven that would be that could be used for operations if needed. These are all these um, these investments are all on your on your financial statements at their fair value, not at their cost value, but at their fair value at, at 63021. Um, this the concentration on the next page 26, the concentration of credit risk talks about the types of investments that you're allowed to have. And we test this. 
um, each year. Uh, you're allowed to have in your furrow investment fund. There's guidelines for allocation. So 40 to 50% have to be in FDIC insured debt instrument or obligations of the US government and agencies. And the other 50 to 60 can be in diversified index funds or exchange traded funds. And this is, this is uh, managed by your finance committee and your um, portfolio managers to make sure that that balance stays, stays within the guidelines that have been set forth. Your custodial credit is the, is the in case of deposits or risk that your deposit accounts, which are your cash accounts, could be lost in the event of a bank failure. So, so it, as of June 30, um, you, had, you did have money exposed to what we call credit risk from FDIC insurance. So FDI insurance is primarily 250,000, but you also have collateral, a tri-party agreement so that your bank, which is First National Bank of Anchorage, or First National Bank Alaska, and a tri another um, institution, there's a tri-party agreement. So they have securities at, this, uh, at another bank that would cover, so your, your cash is completely covered by the collateral they've set aside. And the school district's balances were also insured or collateralized at June 30 also. Page 27 shows your um, capital assets breakdown. And as you can see, the majority of it is your school buildings for your primary government. And then in your business type activities, um, you have your landfill equipment, you have the Healy transfer station, the landfills, and then the school district. The school district has construction in progress. And what these are are projects that they're working on for the school buildings, which under grants that they've received. And when these projects are completed and signed off, then probably, you know, this will be transferred to the borough because the borough is the owner of the school buildings. Page 28 talks about your lease. You do have a lease um, with the Tri-Valley Fire Department for the offices there. And it was um, 36,000 is what you paid for um, your lease there. Let's see. Page uh, 29 shows your, you had very, very few transfers this year. You, um, page 29 shows your transfers between funds. You're allowed, you know, you, you budget for transfers between funds. So you did subs sub subsidize the land management fund, which is the land enterprise fund, $40,000. And the emergency management grant requires a match. So that's where the, the 12,000 and it shows the the permanent investment had 59,000 transferred out into the general fund like we described and it went into the parks and recreation account. Um, the borough has insurance through the um, Alaska Municipal Joint uh, in Insurance Association for coverage over you know, earthquakes, floods, et cetera. So we do, um, we do look at this. We receive a confirmation from um, AML JIA every year and we check these um, check that there are insured there. The school district also has insurance through the Alaska Public Entity Insurance. On page 30, we talk about the landfill. And this is your agreement with the um, State of Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation that you will manage, operate, and maintain the landfill and the two transfer stations. And you're required to assess user fees to ensure the system is self supporting and select individuals trained to operate and maintain the facilities. The borough will also be responsible to maintain and monitor the landfill for 30 years after closure. When the final closure, um, there'll also be 30 years of water monitoring and other monitoring. So that's what we discussed before. You had tipping fees of 342,000 during the last fiscal year 21. Um, so we, and at this point, now the, the landfill is estimated at June 30, 21 to still be able to be used based on their, the most current um, landfill site uh, estimate that it will still be remaining for 32 more years. So we've estimated that it's about 35% uh, usage capacity at this time. So you're required to have at the end when this is closed, which 32 more years, you will um, need to have set aside approximately 3,277,000 in order for closure. Now, this is an estimate as of January, 2019, and it significantly changed from the prior estimate. So obviously we can't 
totally, um, you know, know what it will be in 32 years from now. And part of this, you're closing as you go, as you go along too. So hopefully you'll, you will um, absorb some of those expenses, but, you know, it is required that we, that we look at this, that we understand how much this, um, you know, what this estimate is. And we had to make a large adjustment probably, well, in the FY19, because the, the, the uh, estimate for closure came in a lot higher than we had previously thought it was going to be. Um, you're required by state to provide what's called a financial assurance, assurance report for your closure and post-closure care. And there's several, there's an additional report that's provided to you that's, that's called the government, local government financial test. And there are, several, there are several aspects of what you need to have. You need to have, there's a certain liquidity rate, which means your total cash and your investments um, compared to your expenses. There's a debt ratio, which you have no long-term debt. So you pass that. There's also a third part that is that you cannot have deficits greater than 5% of your revenues in the last two years. So unfortunately with COVID and significant drop in your, um, in your OA, in your overnight accommodations revenue, you did not meet that, those two criteria for 20 and 21. So this was discussed with Clay. Clay discussed this with the department, the actual Department of uh, Environmental Conservation and they have given a waiver for this because of the past care that you've done in your, you know, in maintaining your borough, your landfill, all these, for all these years that you've had it, uh, they did give a waiver of that requirement. That's, but that's something that will be monitored in the future is that you know, we're hoping that revenues will recover, you know, and that's, we're hoping that those revenues recover in the next, you know, year or so that, but, but at this point you are in compliance according to the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. And so, like I said, there's multiple notes describing the PERS, PERS and OPEB, PERS and TERS, because we do the school district. And there's um, multiple pages from, actually from page 31 all the way to, to 47. So, I mean, I, I could go over those, but I'd rather talk about, you know, some more, some, some things I think are more, more of interest to your, to your, you know, to your planning for the future for the borough and things like that. Page 49 shows your, this is one of the required things that you're, um, that you present is your, is how you, how well you did with your budget. It's your, it shows your original budget, your final budget, and then the actual, what your actual expenses are. So you can, you know, go down the line and see you were, you know, you were actually had more uh, revenue than you'd budgeted for. Expenses were pretty close. I mean, at the end on page 50, you had had anticipated that you might have a deficit of as much of 1.325. And this is in the general fund only. And you wound up with a, with a deficit of a million six. So, so you were, you know, you better, that's still a high deficit, but it's basically due to the fact that, that your overnight accommodations taxes were only a million 24,000 instead of normally being 4 million. 3 million, you know, so, so we're looking for recovery in that area. Then there, there's several pages of required information about, about how much your payments are for PERS and, and tours and let's see, let's go to page 64 is your supplementary information. And this shows um, page 65 shows your smaller funds, like we talked about. These are the ones that aren't considered major, but they're still important. They're your, they're your emergency performance grants. And you received uh, money from the uh, Health and Human Services, some MOAs that helped you with your um, COVID testing. And you also received a, a FEMA grant and some COVID relief from the Rasmussen and some uh, Center, for, Center for Tech Life, some funds there. So these are considered your smaller, smaller non-major funds. Let's see. And then the borough always likes, so from pages 67 through about 74, the borough likes to present and likes to show you the, what, what the award was for your, you know, these and what expenses you had and what remaining funds you have there. 
The last section, which starts on federal on page 76, is that federal signal audit that I told you about. And this is basically a compliance audit. It's a requirement for because you had the funds in the excess of 750,000. Page 77 shows what these federal funds were and what departments they came from. Now you always get every year, you get a US department um, payment in lieu of taxes. And so this would have been the one that you received June 30, 2020, you spent in 2021. So that's the 391,000. You received some FEMA assistance of 87,000. You received the smaller, you can see the smaller grants, but they're all the, all these are federal funds and some health and human services money. But the large one is the Department of Treasury, the CARES Fund that you received as a pass through from the Dep Alaska Department of Commerce, Community and Economic Development. And that was the 3,583,000. That was the, um, the revenue and the expenditures was that. So that provided a lot of assistance to the borough in the, in the way of um, testing some um, staff devoted to, to CARES, a lot of um, grants or checks to all kinds of organizations and businesses in your community. So there's still a little bit left of that that needed to be spent by December 31st of 21 that will be in FY22. So what we issue is two, two letters in, in conjunction with this federal single audit. The first one is, it, is your internal control over your financial reporting. And in that case, if there were any, um, we would report deficiencies or material weaknesses in what we described as your internal control. So we test your internal controls over expenditures, over any grant compliance requirements. So we would report a deficiency. And, and if it, deficiency, there's a significant deficiency, which is something lower, but it's still important enough to be presented to governance. And a material weakness is, is a more of a significant deficiency. It's, it's so overriding that likely your financial statements would be uh, misstated and that you would be out of compliance with you know, what you're required to do. We're not reporting for this year for, for the um, FY21 audit. We're not reporting any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. The next letter is your, is actually a compliance. And so what you have to pick out is a major program. So we audited extensively and, usually, and it's got to be the largest program because you need a certain amount of coverage of the, of the uh, federal funds. And so we audited extensively the CARES fund. So we audited expenditures, reporting, um, any compliance that was required from that grant. And so in, the, and in this case, we would also show, we would also report to you deficiencies. So significant deficiencies, or something so overriding that you were completely, you know, you, you were non-compliant as a material weakness. We're not reporting um, any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses over your major programs or over your internal control of your financial statements. So basically that your federal single audit also has a clean opinion. Page 84 just sums up that we gave you an unmodified opinion on your financial statements when we're not reporting any material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, um, or over your federal awards in that you had your major program was your coronavirus, COVID-19 coronavirus, your dollar threshold was 750,000 to trigger the audit and you were not a low risk auditee. And the reason you were not a low risk auditee, a low risk auditee is one that has audits every two years, federal single audits every two years, has no findings. So the fact that you don't have a federal single audit, haven't had one every year, um, did not allow you to be a, a low risk oddity. But you could, if you had federal single audits in the future without findings, then you could be a low risk oddity also. So that is basically, and we're not showing any findings. On the next page, we would describe any findings that we found. We have no um, findings or question costs over your major federal awards or your financial statements. So that is basically your audit. Um, I can address any questions or if there's any other particular notes that you wanted us to discuss that I did not discuss in detail, uh, we can do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Geick. I will open it up to the assembly, um, especially those that might be <coughs> If you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask. 
uh, Mr. Stenger, Mr. Alexander, in particular, I think our newest members. But as always, you did a great job walking us through what you've got. And it is a lot of information. So might have to. It is a lot of information. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I do always appreciate your presentations and thank you for spending your time with us this evening. Um, hearing no other questions, I think we'll go ahead and say good night if you would like to sign out or you can hang out with us for the rest of the meeting. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the assembly. Um, this is my last, uh, last presentation as I am going to retire. Um, so that's my last presentation, but I've always appreciated the support and the information and the feedback that I've gotten um, from the borough assembly over the years. And also, I always appreciate the borough staff and their um, and mayor, Mayor Walker, you know, to to always, you know, provide us what we need to answer our questions, to always be available. So that's always very much appreciated. So thank you all very much. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I might. I'd like to say thanks to you. Uh, pretty impressive. When my head was spinning. I imagine that was uh, that was a ton of work. <laughs> it usually is, <laughs> but it's you know it's yeah you have a very you have a lot of facets between your landfill and you know this year was more complicated, and with the federal single audit and a little later than we normally like, but you know we had more more uh, compliance that we had to make sure that we had it all right before we issued. So, uh, I want to say thanks, and that was a home run. Um, <laughs> Good luck on retirement. Oh, thank you. <laughs> before you before you sign off, Mrs. Guy, um, Miss, Mr. Walker would like to address you. Okay. Yeah, thank thank you, Ms. Sapone. We've we've really enjoyed working with you all these years, Ms. Geek. You've been fabulous as an auditor. You understand us, our operation so so well. You've been so responsive to our needs for so many years, and um, we can't thank you enough for what you've done. Um, if with our financial statements, their auditing over these years, um, I know, and as we've had a lot of different, um, but also very dedicated um, staff along the way, you, you've you've helped them, and and together we've um, we've cleanly, you know, reported our financial position and um, and helped others understand that as we go. And we wish you the best in retirement and, and really appreciate your, your service to the Denali Borough. You've been a big part of, of who we are and where we are. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, that moves us to reports. We would start out with the partner report for those of us on the Zoom. I will read what um, Samus has uh, texted us basically, or written to us. He apologizes that he had to sign out. He wanted to remind everybody at the meeting tonight that we are still able to provide some at-home COVID test kits for the community at our testing location in the Tri-Valley Community Center. Hours of operation are available at our website, horizonmedicalak.com. And if there are any questions for him specifically about COVID or anything community health related, he has attached his email, which we as the borough can make available to you if you so need. Um, so I apologize for not having him uh, speak, but it is important for us to understand our finances as well. So uh, as always, appreciate his taking any time to come and join us, um, especially considering how busy he probably is. So uh, that would take us to our other partner report, which is Ms. Vanessa Jusak with the Chamber of Commerce, who's on the beach. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, so um, update on the chamber side. Uh, I just returned um, from Tucson. I uh, just completed my second year at the uh, Institute for Organizational Management. I uh, had some really good training while I was there. Um, topics such as, is that legal? Uh, building organizational excellence, developing competitive workforce, uh, uh, effective government affairs, marketing strategies, all sorts of really good stuff. So um, halfway through that course, brought back a lot of things um, that I'm happy to share to, to questioning minds. Um, <laughs> lately, been working on a couple of things, um, in particular, doing a lot of collaboration um, with the school district. I uh, spent the last couple of days um, 
doing classes at both Anderson and Tri-Valley High Schools uh, with the high school students on interview and application skills and processes. Um, I've been invited by Superintendent Polta to join one of the uh, school district strategic planning teams regarding community engagement and kind of specifically looking at ways to expand the internship program um, and potentially um, add job shadowing and career highlights to the local students. Uh, also, we are currently the sole area organizer for the Solarized Denali campaign um, for this kind of second round. Um, we are seeking one or two additional people or organizations to assist as an area organizer. Um, but Solarized Denali is an offshoot of uh, the Solarized Fairbanks program. It's supported um, with some other organizational staff and uh, who, who are basically going to teach me and walk me through this process. Um, but this program exists to incentivize um, installing, installing um, solar equipment at residences and businesses in the Denali borough and offers options to lower that cost based on large group participation, um, as well as some financial incentives and opportunities, which um, the program will also help identify, apply for, and utilize. So if anybody out there has got a, a passion for um, renewable energy and wants to contribute uh, to this process, I would greatly appreciate a partner in that. Um, we also, or I also have continued to, um, pay attention to a lot of the issues that the borough is following along with, you know, the potential cruise ship developments for this year, uh, National Park Service funding, status of the J-1 visa program and such. Uh, not a lot of information on any of those fronts, um, but we're definitely keeping our eyes open. Uh, on the visitor center side, we were um, blessed with a grant from the ARPA nonprofit grant program, which is going to allow us to complete a number of organizational goals we have for this year. Um, we will be going to print with our first ever Denali Borough Vacation Planner, hopefully um, by the end of February. And I am currently looking for a part-time temporary assistant to help complete that project. But anyone out there is listening, um, I just posted that on our um, Facebook page and um, We'll have some more information about that moving forward, but shoot me an email if you're interested, info at discoverdenali.org. Um, additional projects from that grant uh, to complete will be um, wayside signage uh, and information, uh, brushing and clearing at those uh, wayside locations and through the canyon walkways and some other potential um, beautification of the canyon area um, and actually the Healy and uh, Anderson and Cantwell uh, light poles potentially also um, some discovered in LA light pole banners. And then I've been participating in our monthly DMO uh, director meetings. DMO is a destination marketing organization. Uh, we have monthly meetings of executive staff across the state and I'm hearing from those groups mainly the same things I'm hearing from our local businesses which is that we are on a course to potentially break uh, tourism records in the state in a variety of ways. All indications are that um, we're gonna be full. <laughs> People are booking earlier than they ever have. Um, and it doesn't seem to be trickling to a stop like we thought it might, um, but also every indication that employment issues and, and lack of employees will still persist uh, for this next summer. So. Um, things will be continue to be challenging in a number of regards and just continue to, to show grace for those employees that do show up. Uh, the latest figures uh, from U.S. Chamber, um, the, the gap between jobs available and people seeking jobs has grown to 3.7 million. Um, so no end to that in the immediate future. Uh, next week, the Alaska Travel Industry is hosting their annual um, conference. It's later in the year than it has occurred before, but I will be attending that and um, hopefully bringing back some uh, additional information from that. And um, that's all I've got. Any questions on any of that? Anybody? Questions for Ms. Jusak? Okay, I do have one. Um, is there any conversation on your end about 
the uh, J1 working program? And is that part of our employee problem? I guess specifically here, I can probably answer that for myself, but maybe you could elaborate on that for us. Uh, it is a portion of our issue. Uh, you know, to generalize, most of people who come over on one of those visas end up working more than one job. So it affects our community in that for every one visa that isn't approved or doesn't happen, two, maybe three businesses are losing somebody who's working a shift or a half of a shift. Um, the program itself hasn't really been suspended. It's just that nobody's approving visas, if that makes sense. Uh, President Biden did make a change to um, certain countries before were basically on a block list, <laughs> you know, places that had high COVID rates. They've changed that. It's a st standard um, test and vaccine protocol now. Doesn't matter where you're coming from. They don't have a special list of, of countries, but the problem is where these people are coming from, do they have the ability to get that vaccine and do they have that ability to do that test in the time that it takes? I think the standard right now is, you know, you have to have taken that test within one day of your departure. And that's just not something that's realistic in every country and every place um, to get the type of test you need in the timeline that you need it for that travel. So, I don't think anybody has a real good idea um, on how much that'll be utilized. Even people with those active visas aren't necessarily having them approved. And then of course the process of approval, like many other federal government tasks is really slow to a trickle. Um, and then you're assuming that people are applying and wanting to leave home in the first place. There's you know, clearly a lot of concern, anybody traveling internationally these days, if they can even get home. So lot, a very complicated issue. Um, that I, I expect will continue to impact us. Okay, thank you for that. Anything else for the Ms. Jusak Chamber? Okay, uh, thank you again for your time and always the effort that you put into your, your organization there. We appreciate it. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, that takes us to the October 21 finance report. We receive it. Thank you. Move to receive the October 21 financial report. Second. It has been moved to receive the October 2021 financial report. Any discussion on that report? Okay. Hearing none, I would, um, all those in favor of receiving the finance report? Aye. Aye. Okay. Report received. That takes us to our school district report. Mr. Polta, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, all your service and ability to, to come in on such a balmy, warm evening so nice. in January, making up for our cold, freezing rain weather in December. Um, can you have a written report that I was able to submit? I'll give a few highlights and, and a couple of updates on a few issues. I want to just mention uh, congratulations and appreciation to Marcia, Martha Tamio, our Tri-Valley uh, tri librarian at the school. She applied for and received a $1,000 grant that will help expand uh, the school's library collections. We appreciate those efforts. Overall, I was hoping that uh, Seamus would stay on. He'd give you the lowdown on the just general update of things with uh, either from the CDC and the changes with the Omicron variant. I think most people know the CDC did update their guidelines, both for the general public and for the school, um, and adjusted the isolation and quarantine periods, basically down to potentially five days. Um, definitely caused like some confusion but the, the documentation is pretty clear. And so the school district is following those new updated guidelines for the period of isolation of a positive case or the uh, quarantine period of a close contact. And also we would remind people that the school is also implementing um, a test to stay protocol where someone who's a close contact could perform a test either at school or at home each day prior to coming to school and provided that that test is negative then they would continue to attend school. And we continue to be universally masked in our schools, which when we see the spread of the Omicron variant seems to be a, a currently wise decision. Um, the number of positive cases uh, 
around the state and nation is incredibly high. So we do see just what they've said with Omicron as we saw coming, it is very uh, effective at transmitting from person to person. Interestingly, some of those other changes with Omicron in terms of the overall less likelihood of severe disease and hospitalization and, and fatality has made some of the metrics that we're used to looking to kind of gauge our general safety or comfort the metrics don't quite work anymore because that whole kind of general calculus of how contagious something is or how, how risky an infection might be is really changed and different. Um, if we look at our number of cases or our hospitalization rate, it's really high, but we also know there are a lot of people doing home tests. And so we're not getting other like potential negative results that would otherwise be reported, but we still have this very high number but it's less severe. So should we be as concerned? And it's very hard, I think, individually. And then, you know, societally as we make kind of collective decisions in the school district to keep going, well, how do we continue to balance this information? We do appreciate those updated guidelines that we did get from the, the CDC on this issue. Um, locally in our school districts, we have had a positive case in both the Anderson School, or not the Anderson School community, but the Tri-Valley School community and the Cantwell School community this week. And we also have an incredible number of staff out in Anderson, um, though no one who has tested has tested positive for COVID. Um, it's one of those things, it's like, oh, did we all just get the flu as well? Um, which is possible because other things continue to happen. Um, I remember in, in one meeting, just kind of going back and circling back to the idea of change in metrics. Uh, an advice from uh, the Department of Health and Social Services here in Alaska was watch the trend numbers, like watch the numbers of the trend or watch the trend line in cases, but not the number of cases. So if you see an increase, understand that that means there's community spread and it's, it's escalating. If we see those numbers decrease, decrease, look at that trend line, but pay less attention to the actual absolute number. They also were referring to some of the issues with hospitalizations that so many people right now have COVID that as they are admitted into the hospital for a procedure such as an appendicitis or childbirth or a broken leg, they might test positive for COVID, but have no respiratory symptoms at all, no respiratory distress, but are being reported as a COVID hospitalization because that's the protocol for reporting a COVID hospitalization. So the member from DHSS recommended probably look at hospitalization numbers a little less, but keep looking at bed availability and pay attention to that ICU availability because that becomes kind of like really important in terms of when people are infected and do have severe illness, when they need that treatment, that'll be kind of a bitter, bigger sign. We also have to remember that those numbers, hospitalization ICUs tend to trail infections by a couple of weeks. So we might take a while from high case numbers to then see that trickle into higher ICU numbers. Just kind of highlighting, just kind of change in nature of the, of the pandemic as it's continued. Um, into its second year and getting close to a third year. Switching and uh, getting to better topics, you know, Vanessa Jusak with the chamber referenced that she was invited to serve on one of the action teams for the strategic plan of the district. And we have uh, kind of confirmed the membership to people that volunteered to serve on those teams. Um, and now those teams are working with the facilitators that we've identified to start coordinating their first meetings. And we hope that they'll be able to complete development of those action plans under each of the strategies for a meeting with the core planning team this spring, hopefully in April or very early May, so that we could confirm or redirect those action plans if needed um, and be able to start implementation work on this strategic plan. Do you wanna make a mention that the district has in-service this coming Monday? And so it is a non-student day for us, but it is still a, a work day. And that day on Monday was planned to coincide with the Martin Luther King holiday because we know a lot of other people in the community do get that uh, day off from work. And we know that that'll help kind of with um, family plans, uh, daycare, and just being able to spend that holiday with your family. 
couple notes and updates on some financial matters. Um, we did receive the final report from the Department of Education on the enrollment reconciliation. This is a report where they go through and kind of go through the disagreements with districts that are both claiming the enrollment of a student in the state. And we had a number of students in Denali Peak that were reported as also enrolled in other public schools in the state. And as a result of that, 17 students were removed from the um, enrollment at Denali Peak for funding purposes. And that corresponds to a decrease in revenue of about $85,000 for this year. Um, so it'll be a small adjustment downward there. We continue to work on our FY23 budget and did a first reading, a presentation of our first reading at our December meeting in Anderson. And we'll do a second reading at next week's meeting at Tri-Valley. Um, currently that budget does include a much more traditional request to the Denali Borough for its local contribution. And that amount right now from our calculations is, that we would be requesting is $2,739,495. So I continue to be very hopeful that the borough is successful in your, uh, was it the grant application, that relief application to the state? Because I do know that the revenue that you received to date is still below what would normally have been received. Um, I would say that, and just kind of as a telegraphing that and the ongoing budget discussion, the board has tasked the administration with looking at a few different budget scenarios. And, and even the one that's the most status quo, if we make no kind of significant, significant changes would project to have a deficit of about $400,000 for next year, which would include that full contribution from the borough. And so therefore would be a deficit that really is not something that could continue into the future and needs to be addressed. And so there will be adjustments into that. Um, especially when we project out, if we were to look at FY24, that we would project a deficit that could grow up to $800,000 without doing any changes to the district. So even as we do some different budget scenarios, some of which are, are much more drastic, our much more status quo scenario is, is still going to have some changes to our operations because we know that we need to be using our funds that we receive on an annual basis to be covering our costs that we incur on an annual basis. Um, that's kind of the purpose and design of the funding so cycle of, of schools. Um, it just unfortunately leads to some painful decisions and hard conversations at times. I'm also holding uh, some budget meetings at each site to gather input from staff and community at each site. I've completed those, uh, met with the Tri-Valley CSE yesterday and Tri-Valley staff. Um, today, and then I start meeting with Cantwell and Anderson next week. And again, we have a second reading of our budget next Thursday, and we'll do a third reading in Cantwell in our February meeting, and potentially do a, a fourth reading before an adoption, and then that formal transmittal of request to the Denali Assembly. Let me give an update on some facilities issues. Um, you heard me reference that exciting weather that we had over the Christmas break. Um, kind of impacted each one of our school buildings as well. Cantwell was the best. Um, it kind of had no issues other than the uh, heater in the gym, the blower um, wasn't working. And so without that large space being kind of properly heated, the building was colder than we'd wanted during that period of time. And I kept checking in with uh, Principal Mason um, and just kind of one of the questions I asked her was, you know, what are you hearing from the Cantwell families and the Cantwell community? And kind of that question, do we need to start looking at opening the school as a place for people to go? And through her connection, she felt that the kind of the Cantwell community um, was in a sense well taken care of and uh, most of the individuals were very well prepared for long-term power outages. Though I do know um, that the uh, McKinley Village Community Center did open up for people and that some people in that area is, I was talking, I think one of our teachers that, uh, has not been able to return to her house yet. That it, it was left at the time, not quite livable, um, but the landlord was doing some repairs and hoping to be able to move in tomorrow. Right. At Tri-Valley, you know, it was rain and it didn't freeze right away. And if you remember right now, we have some problems with rain and water draining off of our roofs. And our crews were aware and did pay attention to the fact that we were gonna have liquid water in December and we're able to put our pumps 
ready to work to help drain that roof, they couldn't keep up with the rain that fell and the melt that happened. And so we had water intrusions uh, pretty significantly in the school. I'd say fortunately, you know, we were able to, well, unfortunate, well, a fortunate thing is it got cold, so it stopped raining and stopped melting. So the additional water stopped coming in and we were able to dry the rooms out. We were able to sanitize and disinfect the spaces. Um, overall, it just highlights the need to, again, move forward with uh, that renovation of those roof spaces. Um, we also did some work and just that overall concern that as we continue to get water intrusions into the roof, we know that that does weaken the materials of the roof. Um, so Curtis took a look at the construction materials, like the, the big support beams in those sections and looked at their weight ratings and then calculated out, well, what's the weight, you know, square footage weight of the snow and ice that's up there. And we're well within our tolerances, like well within our tolerances. So even if there's a small degradation in the strength of those components, our roof is very secure. It is not at risk of any, any failure in terms of like a collapse. It just, you know. It's not operating as a roof because a roof shouldn't have water coming through it. Okay. In Anderson, the roof was fine, but we had a problem with the pneumatic heating system uh, controlling some of the valves into the elementary wing and the elementary wing heat turned off and we froze pipes there. We were able to catch that and get things heated and thawed before any damage was done. So there was no pipe breakage. Um, it was just kind of like a, a scary time right before school started to make sure that we were able to heat that up, that there was no damage, and that we were able to make sure that school could come in comfortably that first day back. Um, we've looked at where our sensors are located in the call back call out system that we use. And we'll be expanding the location of the sensors at Anderson and actually did a review and we'll be doing some upgrades of the system that we use for that same type of monitoring at Tri-Valley and Cantwell too. Um, just to, again, further ensure that at any of our sites, any type of outage like this, we would be automatically alerted to so that we'd be able to go in and do preventative work and really ensure that we're not going to have our freeze up. Right. So the last facility issue was an update that I did with Curtis just today, um, looking at the solar project that we've been talking about in response to the donation from Rural Energy Solutions. And at this point, we're settling in on a array at this point, which might be 46 panels, um, total cost of about $70,000. And after the donation from uh, RES would cost about $44,000. And it would, at that price range, would have about an eight year payback to the district, which seems um, something that, that would be wise to do. Um, I need to walk with Curtis and look at the actual size or footprint of it, because that's a pretty big array and look at that and just even visually go, what's the real impact of this on things? Um, well, that's what we're currently looking at. And we've also been working with the Department of Education. Um, and since the overall cost of the project is over $50,000, it would qualify as a major school maintenance grant request. And because a portion of the funding is coming from a source other than that grant program, namely the donation from RES, that donation would be the local contribution. So it might take a while to get that funding returned to the district, but we could potentially be able to do this at, at no direct cost to the district. I also would like to mention, I might've mentioned it in the December meeting, we also had a community member reach out and make a $2,500 donation to the district to support this project. So again, that's something that in addition to the donation from RES um, will help reduce that cost and make sure that we expand this project a little bit, helping reduce our overall reliance on uh, mains power and our ongoing energy costs year to year. Do you want to give a couple staff updates as a closing thing? Um, the school board did provide a one-year uh, leave of absence for our special education teacher at Tri-Valley, Johanna Sestito. She applied for and was selected as a Fulbright Scholar, and the program is scheduled uh, for next uh, school year in August, provided that COVID doesn't uh, kind of scupper things for her. And she requested that, that leave, and it was granted. So we are advertising for a special ed teacher at Tri-Valley right now. 
And we also did uh, with regrets accept the resignation of Nathan Pitt, the principal at Tri-Valley. Um, they've decided that it is time for them to, to move on and look for uh, another location. And we wish uh, the Pitts all the best in their future um, and have begun advertising and recruiting for that position as well. And with that, I would entertain any questions. I thought you said that was going to be a lighter note, Mr. Polta. Ouch. No, that's not a lighter note. It was just the last note. Mm. Any uh, questions for Mr. Polta about the school or school district? Hearing none. Um, as always, thank you for your detailed report, your time, and hanging out with us while we got to you. Um, always appreciated. You're welcome. And I will watch the rest of your meeting uh, on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, so that takes us to the mayor's report. All right, thanks, Ms. Stapone. Uh -huh. um, the written report did come in a little later than the mail packets went out and it is on your onboard um, packet. And these do go on our website later too for the public as well. So I apologize for kind of a later submittal and appreciate those reports um, and and uh, thanks Seamus for trying to attend there, but um, I don't have anything specifically COVID in my written report, but I do wanna um, maybe touch base on a couple of things that he may have reported on and, and those are vaccination um, availability. We are blessed here thinking about Vanessa's report, how a lot of folks in the world can't find vaccinations or tests and even in this country and um, and you know, we do have vaccinations provided every Monday night here at Tri-Valley Community Center by Horizon Medical through that MOA with Public Health. And um, tests, we still have the, the regular testing hours um, at the old bank space, calling it the Public Health Annex. Those hours are posted on both the borough website and Horizon's um, website. And the borough did ask for and receive a shipment of rapid of, of home rapid tests, which we have worked to get out into the communities. Um, the city of Anderson received a box of, I believe, 250. And they're dispersing those at, at City Hall. Um, National Park Service headquarters received a box. Cantwell has received a box. And here in Healy, those are being dispersed by both Horizon at the um, at that public health annex and also here in the Denali Borough office. With the shortage in the country of these um, home rapid tests, we are um, <clears throat> providing one per family member right now. But you know, if you wanna come in later and get another one, feel free, we do have enough to do that um, right now. We just don't want you know people selling them on eBay because they are <laughs> pretty highly <laughs> prized right now, but they are also an, an important tool. So, um, so those are available now. Um, now moving into the um, into the written report. Let's start off with with the severe weather, the severe winter storms. We we the relentless storms we suffered in late December and early January really took a toll on on both private and and public infrastructure. Um, power outages occurred through the borough. The longest one was in the McKinley Village, which was without power and communications for 36 hours. Um, <clears throat> neighbors helped neighbors. Uh, and, and while it was a record snow and, and really unusual ice event in a lot of the borough, we, we, we do as we do, we persevered through some of the most challenging conditions. And in calls with the State Emergency Operations Center through the disaster emergency period, I stress the importance to uh, Denali Borough residents of the snow clearing on the state roads and highways and the resilience of our utility infrastructure. The governor did declare a state of emergency disaster, which did include the Denali Borough. So with that, without, without requiring a local declaration, the primary damage relief program, such as individ the individual assistance program and the public assistance program, are open to Denali Borough residents and organizations. The, the borough has um, added a, a, 
component to our website, a new web page on our website with information regarding these programs, which are managed by the state. So for more information or to report storm damage, please do go to that website, denaliborough.org slash winterstorm. Um, and we, we, the borough has received a request from an individual to assist with snow plowing and supplies delivery. We, we have worked with our local charitable organization, Neighbor to Neighbor, and we're also working with another charitable organization in Fairbanks. Uh, to meet those needs, to supply, to um, deliver those supplies. We've directed that person to the state's individual assistance program and offered evacuation. But our mechanisms for providing such assistance in terms of snow plowing on, 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 um, on non-maintained roads are, are limited. And the state has indicated that plowing expenses on such roads uh, may not be an eligible expense for reimbursement through that public assistance program. So that has been an issue that we've been working through and, and is a challenge, um, not, not an easy resolution. Um, going back a little bit further, uh, released back in December 15th, but it was, it was since our last assembly meeting, the governor uh, did release his 2023 20, budget. It does prioritize public safety. It does fully fund the BSA, the base student allocation for K through 12 education and does include funding for many programs important to municipalities, including the Denali Borough and the city of Anderson, such as the community assistance program. Um, it fully funds that program, but it doesn't, it disperses the monies within the, the program, but it doesn't fully recapitalize it to its, its $90 million um, statutory number. It recapitalizes it to 60 million. But really a glaring omission is the lack of funding for the major school maintenance program. The state is once again, and this is repeated years, successive years, it's a non-participant in the primary mechanism of addressing major maintenance needs of our state school infrastructure. Uh, and and um, so you have a resolution to that um, in your packet tonight and then I, in my written report, do have a little editorial that you know, meeting the state's constitutional responsibility of maintenance of its education system cannot be framed, should not be framed, uh, you know, as a as a reduction in the dispersal of permanent fund dividends, which absent a, su a sustainable fiscal plan is really kind of the current situation when you say we need funding for this, where is it going to come from? So. That's why we also have in our legislative priorities the need for a fiscal plan where the state can, can meet its, its constitutional responsibilities. Um, moving forward to the second page of the written report, um, Lori, uh, Ms. Geek did a great job with uh, the presenting the financial statements. Um, I mentioned some of the same um, notes here, how we're, we're proud that it was a, a clean audit, no findings and unmodified opinion. Thank and do thank the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation Division of Solid Waste. Really do appreciate having a good working relationship with them. And, and I think they appreciate that we've had such, such a high scoring um, uh, landfill so, for so many years to, to offer that, that exemption really with, with no, no, not, no, not much of a hassle um, to, um, on that operational deficit test that, that we did fail this year with two two successive deficit years. They, they are understanding and um, led to an un unmodified opinion. And having our first federal single audit ever and you know turnover in our treasurer position um, and so much in terms of financial management and reporting as it came to the dispersal of those CARES funds, I uh, just wanna give a big kudos to our, our staff, to our everybody is involved in finances in the in the office, which is pretty much everybody, but specifically County McMaster, Sherry Shorey, Allison Johnson, and and previously Wendy Planty um, have done just an excellent job in um, financial reporting. But everybody's involved in approvals and and um, and, and and reporting along the way. So so kudos to the finance team. Um, and yeah, after steep. Uh, revenue losses, you know, we do have a contracted fiscal position. 
we we have had um, year over year declines in our unrestricted and unassigned fund balances. And that accounting of CARES funds as a revenue, <clears throat> it does positively influence our forward funding figure. I've already done some of the modeling for our forward funding figure as we look towards budget season. And um, <clears throat> it positively influences that number for the next budget cycle, but it does not change the fact that those funds could not be used as general revenue. Um, and they were primarily dispersed, you know, throughout the borough communities. Um, so you, you're going to see a, a kind of larger forward funding number, but it's it's a little bit unrealistic um, based on um, just the way that's accounted for, frankly. And yeah, Superintendent Polta mentioned the um, what I'm calling the six million dollar question right now, which you know is those those relief applications we have four million into the state under their local government lost revenue. Uh, replacement grant program and the other potential potential of um, <clears throat> additional ARPA monies through Treasury um, for public lands counties, which may um, add up to a million dollars a year for two years. It's 750 million in ARPA funds to public lands counties, and what our portion of that will be right now is is as yet of known unknown. So there is still. You know, a, a level of uncertainty is that $6 million question is still, still out there, um, but we do hope to be hearing on some of those programs um, shortly. I've, I've hoped that we have, would have heard by now, actually. Moving on, um, the Antler Ridge Trail easement um, that we've applied to for, from DNR, uh, they have adjudicated that request they have provided a manager's decision recommending issuance of that uh, non-motorized public easement across state land helping to connect the Antler Ridge Trailhead parking area. When you leave there it does go through borough land and then state land and eventually the trail will touch federal land as well. Um, so we're currently reviewing the draft easement and the entry authorization, actually just signed that entry authorization today. So that's, that's moving forward at a pretty good clip. And some of the trails, trails folks we've been working with were impressed that we've already, already, already made it this far with, um, with that application. DNR has been pretty good to work with on that. Um, moving to DOT, uh, the milepost 231 safety enhancement project. DOT, DOT did host on January 6th, a public meeting project update detailing the, the design scope and construction timetable for this long planned and very much needed project. Um, <clears throat> but the scope isn't, isn't what it always was. Um, this, this project at one time was bigger in scope, did uh, have a full bridge replacement, which would get you that left turn lane into McKinley Village southbound. Um, that was a $48 million project that, that could not be funded, that was not being funded. And the project was con, con, constricted to um, a $13 million project, which it is funded and, um, and uh, construction is for next summer, summer of 2022. Um, the, the scope is construction of that new wayside. That's gonna be great inside Denali National Park construction of new turn lanes for the wayside, the 231 intersection, but not all the turn lanes that we wanted, um, not a left as you're going southbound, um, and, um, and a turn lane at the Old Parks Highway intersection at mile post 230. Construction of new pedestrian facility connections under the Nanana River Bridge on both sides and trail connections on that park side. Um, so this is the scope of the 231 DOT project that, that is funded through the STIP. Uh, um, that, that, and then there's a separate project that's funded in a completely different manner. And that is the pedestrian bridge across the Nanana River. That's a little, that's downstream of the highway bridge and that's funded through the FLAP program, which we applied for in conjunction with the National Park Service and DOT. And it is on a different timeline and it's not going to be constructed this year, which is disappointing to, to some folks who, who see that need. Uh, I, I hear that it's just on a different timeline and is going to come after um, 
the 231 project, um, but it will be a, a great safety addition as well, that very much needed pedestrian bridge across the Nanana River. Um, and then uh, I guess really next moving forward, things in the future to put on your calendar to think about attending. Um, January 19th, there's, um, there, well, there's a couple things going on next Wednesday at 6 p.m. One is the F Division of Forestry is hosting the um, a Spruce Beetle Public Workshop. A panel of foresters are hosting an informational ses session at 6 p.m. and you can register for that virtual session at alaskasprucebeetle.org. We, um, some borough staff met with uh, these foresters um, that was yesterday, had a good meeting with them, heard a lot of the presentation that they'll be uh, providing to the public and um, we're able to talk about some of our uh, mitigation efforts at that time. Um, but this will be good information for the public. And then also next Wednesday night is the Denali Borough Planning Commission meeting in which uh, the commission will be considering approval of a list of um, 317 street names throughout the borough. We do have a lot of streets here, huh? over 400 actually. So the lion's share of them are up for um, those names and that street naming process that we've been working on for a while now. Um, coming up on a, a year, I think it was April when we had uh, those big public meetings about mm -hmm. street names. And then we mm -hmm. went back and changed code uh, to reflect uh, some of that public comment that we received. And now we do feel ready to move forward. Um, uh, with with approval of that that big chunk of street names, and then there's also process and code too for potentially changing names at other times as well. Um, so that's this next Wednesday, and um, also mark your calendars a little further forward. Denali Winterfest is scheduled for February 25th to 27th, and um, the borough is planning a, a Saturday evening event, and and that's the 26th, I believe. Um, <clears throat> in which we'll, we'll, we'll provide a great community dinner and a nice fun community night at the, um, the Tri-Valley Community Center in the big room. And the activity this year will again be bingo. <laughs> Cantwell's bringing the bingo and we'll have bingo with prizes again. That was a hit last time. Was it? So that's February 26th. And um, the nomination period for the Mayor's Community Service Award uh, will be opening up tomorrow. So look for that notification and considering consider nominating those who have been doing so much for our community um, recently in this past year. Um, so that, that uh, nomination period will open up tomorrow, January 13th and run till the end of the month. Uh, I do wanna mention that we've been in talks with the school district and the school board and, and the assembly about that joint work session that we like to have every year around February. And um, we picked the date, February 2nd. Um, so consider that when it comes to next meetings. Um, and um, we'll look forward to drawing up the agenda for that. Um, that good time to get together with the school board and the assembly. I was looking at charter today and it's actually in charter to have that, that joint meeting of the, of the bodies. Um, and to... Uh, and the Alaska Municipal League will be holding its legislative conference in Juneau, February 16th to 18th. Information is on their website. I'm kind of playing wait and see right now in terms of um, how things are going to be there, whether the Capitol will even be open. And I have not yet registered for the conference. Um, and so, you know, maybe do the same if you're if you if you might be interested in in attending if if we're going um, keep an eye out on your email and um, but right now it's kind of up in the air I also want to um, uh, mention one other thing in later February and that is um, Fairbanks North Star Borough is working through their comprehensive economic development strategy their SEDS it's required um, by EDA to be eligible for those those EDA grants, that's Economic Development Agency, um, to have a SEDS. And we are, as you'll see in the rest of the meeting tonight, applying for some EDA grants so in conjunction <laughs> with, with partners, but um, we're using the state SEDS as our backing for that. And 
And EDA is recommending that at some point you know, the Denali Borough should go through that, that strategy process and develop our own development strategy. Um, and we're, we're kind of excited to learn from the North Star Boroughs. They're working through theirs. They're hosting what they're calling an Interior Alaska Economic Summit, February 22nd and 23rd. And um, uh, Teresa Floberger, staff member for Community Development, is planning on attending that. Um, so that's maybe something to, to flag as well. So with that, I will um, conclude my report and entertain any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions for the mayor? Um, any any idea on when the the six million dollars and and I know that you've been waiting and thought that you might hear from this, but it's no problem. yeah. Well, the state did extend their deadline okay. um, to December thirty first for their application. So it's and with the holidays and and disasters, um, right? <laughs> the um, it's not surprising that we haven't heard. I, I do know that um, from the director of DCRA that they're working on it and um, they do hope to have something uh, soon. <laughs> the treasury piece is really, um, uh, um, I keep asking NACO, National Association of Counties, I'm, I'm on the board there, mm -hmm. um, is actually named in, in that section of 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 language of ARPA, um, wherein, uh, wherein $1.5 billion is designated to public lands counties. It specifically says to work with NACO on developing a framework for the allocation on this. And I've been a participant in some of those um, efforts. And that's why I kind of came up with that uh, million dollars a year for two, for two years, because in the allocations that we were working on that was what it was about it was about 960,000 for the Denali borough mm -hmm. now whether treasury is going to accept that or come up with a new allocation formula um i don't know i do know that naco keeps saying treasury's just been so busy with the arpa fu funding with the 65 billion dollars um and they just came out last Friday with their final interim rule, they called it, the final um, um, guidance on how you can use your ARPA monies. Um, now for us, it's pretty simple. We only got 200,000 this year and we're you know, giving it to the school district. It's pretty simple for us, but there was a big push. A lot of cities are getting a lot of money. Fairbanks is getting 17 million and um, you know, how they can use those monies just came, just was finalized in that um, final rule, came out on Friday. So the thinking from NACO is that now that that's done, now that that big push is cleared out, this public lands piece has been backburnered clearly. And hopefully they can get to that next and let us give us guidance because yeah, the, you know, the, the fiscal year started in October, right? Even though ARPA was passed way back in oh, was a long time ago, well mm -hmm. before October, it was it May or something. Yeah. So, um, so we knew that one was going to be further out because even though ARPA was passed, I'm going to say May, um, we knew it didn't start till October, October one for this fiscal year. So, um, yeah. We'll keep we'll keep, keep pushing for information, crossed. and um, and keep yeah keep your fingers crossed right. and <laughs> and uh, any other uh, any other things one may do along those lines is is appropriate here yeah. Thanks. Hopefully before the next meeting. Yeah. Certainly before Hold your budget breath. time. My yeah. goodness, going into budget time with this uncertainty would be yeah. annoying. Yeah. Um, adequately answered. Yes. Great. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, for. Yeah keeping us in tune with what's happening. Okay, that takes us to our assembly comments and I will follow Jared's lead and start at the top of the list. That means Mr. Canale, you are up. All right, thank you. Um, again, once again, uh, for all the great reports uh, for this past month, uh, appreciate all the hard work going into generating those. And uh, big congratulations uh, to Mayor Walker and staff for uh, uh, a clean audit finding. That's uh, great to hear. 
uh, especially in a very challenging time. It's uh, pretty impressive to see how well uh, the, the management team there has managed finances through the course of the, the last fiscal year. So uh, thanks for all that hard work. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Mr. Alexander. I just second Mr. Canale's comments and uh, good job on the financial stuff. That's it. Great. Mr. Shreve. I'd like to thank everybody that's listening and that came in the comments that we've had and that we just know that we hear all the comments and we are taking action on them. It just how fast we can take the action just depends on what type of uh, what we have going on. So thank you. Yeah, I would like to echo the appreciation for the reports. It does make our comment section a little dry when they do such a good job um, informing us beforehand. Um, I am going to save most of my comments for the end. And then just again, thank you to the Healy Hockey folks who took their time to come. Um, Teresa, Ms. Floberg, who's hanging out here to brief us on the resolutions coming around the corner. Um, you know, it, it does speak volumes that we do interact um, so casually with our with our constituents, with the public. Um, I do hope that that continues and continues to get better. And I think it has. Uh, I do hear a lot of people who watch these meetings um, afterwards. So they might be quiet, but they are paying attention, which is always a good thing. Um, Mr. Stanger. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow along with everybody else's comments. Uh, fantastic job by the borough assembly and the mayor on the financial um, report and, and the, all the work that goes into it. And uh, like I, I said earlier, just to boggles my mind, the amount of work that goes into that and the complexities and how well it came out um, gives me a lot of faith in the people we got doing those jobs. And I uh, want to say thanks to the, uh, Community comment, I think uh, the hockey rink is a pretty worthy um, investment for the community, and I'll save the rest later. Thanks. All right. Um, that does put us right at the two-hour mark. Does anybody need five minutes? Any objections to just kind of keep going? I know I know your answer. I'm talking to him. <laughs> keep going. Talking to Mr. Canale. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, the next two are going to be fast. Our ordinances, uh, item number one, our draft ordinances, and we have zero on tonight's agenda. And then item number two for pending ordinances, uh, we also have zero. So that is a very fast section. Um, that will take us over to resolutions. And I think at this point, I would like to um, give... Ms. Floberg, the floor to kind of brief us in the program and what she's kind of cooked in. We have one. There's a couple. No, what do you want? The, the oh, excuse there. me. You're right. I'm sorry. I'll see the first two yeah. and then, I yeah. just got excited. <laughs> I, she came over here. She threw me off. <laughs> anyway, okay. Let me backtrack that. Let's start with resolution 22 01, uh, Denali Borough 2022 Legislative Priorities. I move to approve uh, resolution 22 01. I second that. It's been moved by Mr. Shreve and seconded to approve uh, Denali Borough resolution 22 01. Mr. Mayor, would you like to expand on this for us? Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Pone. Um, each year we do uh, in resolution form state our legislative priorities. And this, this resolution doesn't go too far afield from, from last year's stating a priority of the funding level for the community assistance program, the importance of that program to the Denali Borough and, and uh, we should also, also note the city of Anderson. It's important to them as well. Um, the uh, funding of the uh, PERS and TERS retirement programs and, and resolving to um, stick to that 2008 agreement wherein the participants know how much we're contributing. Um, the state in the past has taken runs at, at uh, increasing municipalities' contributions there and going away from that agreement. So we want to hold, hold that. And, um, and I did add... Let's see, what's that? One, two, three, four, five. The sixth, whereas is a new one. 
and that is speaks to waysides um, through the through the Denali Borough Parks Highway corridor, the the DOT and public facilities facilities they are an important facility they are important facilities here within the Denali Borough, and right now a number of them are barricaded, which is new, and it's a, a really a kind of a heightened level of of closure. Um, like which um, really does not help encourage a longer visitor season. Um, and you know, we'd like to make the statement that for the comfort and enjoyment of the traveling public and to encourage a longer visitor season, these essential services need to remain usable. Now, I know all the way through the winter might be, you know, a higher lift, but more of a shoulder season at least but at least considering how we can have winter, you know, facilities here is something that, you know, within the DOT operational budget, you know, I'd like the legislature to consider um, and I'd ask the assembly to, to agree on that one as well. Um, and, and then last year we made a similar statement about the need for a fiscal plan. That's what the next statements are about. Um, <clears throat> and then in the now therefore be it resolved, capitalizing community assistance, opposing it. You know, let's let's uh, amend, if I might ask for an amendment on this, um, to 90 million on that number. It says 60 million here. Can we amend that to not ask for an amendment there? We will, we will we we'll make it so. It. Yeah. So that full number and um, opposing cost shifts to municipalities and supporting a balanced approach to resolving the state's projected budget deficits. I understand the governor's budget does not have a deficit, but it does also rely on one-time federal funding. So in the future, there would be a deficit. Um, so taking those measurable steps towards a fiscal plan for a healthy Alaskan future. Okay. Uh, discussion on resolution 2201. I can't do it. But I, I move to amend the which one? Therefore, be it resolved. The therefore be it resolved. Uh, the Denali Borough Assembly respectfully request the Alaska State Legislature favorable consider the community assistance funding from sixty million to ninety million. Second that. Okay. Any any discussion or on the amendment? Hearing none, I would take a vote for the amendment. Is that it's just a show of hands? Aye. Show of hands? Hi. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, so amended. Any other uh, discussions or comments on the resolution at hand? Um, hearing none, I do have one food for thought. I did not realize they concrete barricaded our rest stops, but um and maybe if we could petition for like every other rest stop i mean you know there's quite a few people who still like live here and drive to fairbanks and the um i can't imagine the dot folks like picking up the the refuse and stuff every spring from them just leaving them closed um now i know there's complications with the septic and the weather and like you said maybe not all winter long but you know we do have you know, almost 2000 people here that drive the highway throughout the borough all the time. And unfortunately nature calls when it calls. Now we all are used to getting out of our cars, but do we need to do that really? Um, just food for thought, maybe not all of them, but maybe we could get one in between here in Fairbanks and one in between that South border. And... Yeah, thanks for that. They're, they're not all barricaded. Um, the a, the a popular big, ones are a big long one that's a good pull out for safety right at my at our northern um line near um near 287 mm -hmm. um that one's not barricaded i pulled in there for safety and a phone call not that long ago um but um but yeah there are some barricaded and it's new this year yeah. um you know just food for thought i think that's kind of egregious but that's okay uh and um uh, yeah so if there are no other points of discussion i would take a roll call vote on approval yes this is a vote yes 
Dominic Canell. Yes. Jeff Sanger. Yes. David Alexander. Yes. Just unanimous. Okay. Second resolution of the evening, resolution 22-02, Major School Maintenance Partnership with the State of Alaska. I move to approve resolution 22-02. I second that. Has been moved by Mr. Shreve and seconded. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you care to walk us through this one as well? Yeah, thank you. We did bring forward this more directed, honed um, message forward last year as well. And it, it does appear to be getting some traction. Um, the legislature did, did fund this program to 25 million um, last legislative session. That, that sum was, was vetoed by the governor, but um, there's, there's movement in amongst, um, well, in the superintendent's report, he said that a number of superintendents had, had crafted a letter um, regarding this issue. And, um, and I think it's a very worth while issue to keep hammering on because we need the state to be a partner in the maintenance of our schools. Okay, questions, comments from the borough, from the assembly, pardon. Um, hearing none, I would like to initiate a roll call vote for approval. David Alexander? Yes. Dominic Canelli? Yes. Singer? Yes. Alex Yes. Chris is the phone? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, back to my lovely introduction. <laughs> uh, Teresa Floberg has been working on behalf of the Denali Borough to help proctor um, some EDA or Economic Development Administration American Rescue Plan grants. And I would like to let her talk about it as an introduction rather than I for she is the expert. Very good, thank you. All right, so what we have in the works right now um, and what the resolutions are meant to do is to support applications for five different EDA grants in partnership. Um, under the Economic Development Administration programs through the American Rescue Plan Act, um, two of the programs are what we're focusing on. One is the travel tours and an outdoor recreation program, and the other is the economic adjustment assistance program. As these different applications get developed, it will help guide which of those two programs each application is best suited for. More and more, the T tour, the outdoor recreation one, um, is going to suit the, the majority of these five. Um, for any grant proposal, um, and especially under this program with the EDA, job creation and retention, and then attracting private investment are the top priorities and the targets for any projects proposed through the applications. Um, and so I'll just go through and um, talk about the five very briefly and um, confirm the organization the um, partnership is with. So um, resolution 22-03 is with the Denali Chamber of Commerce, looking at a public well for safe drinking water, trying to finally have a public water source in, in the borough. Um, the second one is with the Discover Denali Visitor Center, looking at a summer shuttle between Healy and Carlo Creek for both visitors and residents. 22-05 is with Healy Hockey Association for community ice rink improvements, which you heard about earlier. 22-06 is with the Healy Valley Lions Club for Auto Lake Park improvements. And then 22-07 is with the Native Village of Cantwell for um, bike paths in their community. And so the way the applications work is the nonprofits or the native village of Camwell as a community would be the applicant. They require involvement by their municipality. And so for the nonprofit specifically being a co-applicant or even, you know, a supporting partner is important part of that process for them. Um, because the nonprofits and the native village of Camwell is, would be the applicant. Um, they would be the ones facilitating the project, being the project manager. It's really up to them and their boards and members to decide the scope of the projects. Um, and they're also going to hold the responsibility of the 20% match requirement 
for these different grants. Um, the it's all preliminary preliminary for all of these currently trying to get these applications off the ground. So you asked earlier from Healy Hockey, what is the projects involved? That's what we're trying to work on with the, the different applications is what, what is going into these applications, so. But there's no financial commitment from the borough? There's not. Can you um, relay the timeline? So the deadline for the applications is March 31st, but it is a rolling program. So applications are being accepted and funded now. And so the hope of getting these resolutions um, approved in the January meeting is to allow those applications to proceed and then get in as soon as possible, um, the sooner the better. So, and for any of the projects, the grant programs, it's a hundred thousand dollars floor for what could be requested. Um, the ceiling is 10 million, which simply because of the 20% matches is well above and beyond what I expect any of them to be. Um, so, yeah. yeah, all of them focusing on, again, the um, job creation and retention and attracting private investment is key to any projects that are proposed in these applications. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the assembly on behalf of the program in general before we dive into these resolutions one at a time? Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and- No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. I, I think I heard you correctly. You said the scope of these projects are still yet to be defined. Yes. Is that correct? So yeah. there's nothing concrete about a, a transportation system that would only run between Carlo and, and Healy. That could be expanded to include Cantwell or other communities if it made sense to do so. Correct. Yep. And so that okay. is what the Discover Denali Visitor Center will be working on right. with its board. Um, and what they want to pursue with this application. So again, hopefully we have five applications that go in. It could be fewer than that, but simply supporting the applications is the first step. Right. And as far as the community uh, public well uh, generalized location, is that going to be centered somewhere in the Healy area or is that yet to be determined as well? So through the Chamber of Commerce, the idea was that is that that would be located at the Chamber of Commerce. At the Chamber, okay. Got it. Thank you. It could be the first of three. Could be the first of three, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so any anybody else real quick? Sorry, you, Mr. Canal, your, your screen kind of lagged up on you, so I didn't mean to brush past you at all. That's uh, okay, no worries. Um, okay, so resolution 22-03, uh, the Economic Development Administration American Rescue Plan. What's the acronym for that? ARPA. ARPA, that's what we're going to go with. The ARPA grant application for the public well for safe drinking water on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. I move to approve resolution 22-03. Second it. Okay, it has been moved by Mr. Shreve to approve resolution 22-03 and seconded. Any discussions on this um, particular resolution for the group? Okay, hearing none, I would ask for a roll call vote of approval. Uh, yes. Yes. Alan Street? Yes. David Alexander? Yes. Chris is the phone? Yes. Great. All right, resolution 22-04, a resolution to support a grant application with the Discover Denali Visitor Center for a summer shuttle initiative through the EDA ARPA program. Ha, ah, see? Gosh. I move to approve resolution 22-04. And second that. And move to approve by Mr. Shreve and seconded. Any discussion on the transportation shuttle program uh, possibility application, whatever. So the, the limits of it is, is to be determined. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, any, not hearing any other discussion, I would ask for a roll call vote for approval. David Alexander? Yes. Dominic Canale? Yes. Alan Shreve? Yes. Jeff Stanger? Yes. Is it yes. Unanimous. Perfect. 
That takes us to resolution 22, right? Yeah, 205. The resolution to support a grant application with Healy Hockey Association for Healy Ice Rink upgrades through the EDA ARPA program. I move to approve resolution 22-05. Second that. It's been moved to approve by Mr. Shrevan. Seconded. Any discussion on the ice rink and potential upgrades? Hearing and seeing none, I will ask for a roll call vote of approval. Jeff Sanger? Yes. Dominic Canelli? Yes. Alan Shreve? Yes. David Alexander? Yes. Chris Zippel? Yes. Yeah, Russ. Okay. Uh, before we go into this next one, I have a question about me voting or not. I have to for quorum. Okay. So, uh, resolution 22-06, a resolution to support a grant application with the Healy Valley Lions Club for Auto Lake Park upgrades through the Economic Development Administration American Rescue Plan. This is why I said the EDA ARPA program. <laughs> That's a lot. I move to approve resolution 22 06. I'll second that. <laughs> Has been moved by Mr. Shreve and seconded. Um, any discussion on this? What, what, what is their plan? Is there any outline of what they what they hope to? For the Healy Valley Lions Club? Yeah. Um, let me I mean, myself. So, <laughs> if you want me to? You don't have to unmute yourself. You talk to the box. Um, in our conversation just yesterday, um, focusing on um, toilets, uh -huh. um, potentially bringing power to the park for events, a boat launch, landscaping. Mm -hmm. so. uh, yeah. So my my little discussion piece here is to transparently admit that I am the president of the Healy Valley mm -hmm. Lions Club. <laughs> Uh, we did have a meeting yesterday where we discussed the process and everything else, which is kind of why I was towing with her about the introductions. But um, full disclosure, like she said, we have been desperately looking for funding to replace the outhouses. Mm -hmm. That is a need before we became the current club, really. Um, the power to the pavilion would be another one and a starter thing for potentially um, maybe an outdoor stage for like the Blueberry Festival, or we talked about maybe partnering with the community library for Shakespeare in the Park. I mean, just some fun stuff to really, I mean, we looked at the map and we've got 13 acres up there that mm -hmm. are in our jurisdiction as the Lions Club. And we're really only utilizing what you see when you drive by. So we have a lot of potential and this is kind of like a, a real fun springboard for us. And I would um, forfeit my right to vote, but I have to. So, any other discussion? I don't have to. Well, no, it's it's you're not being you're not concede. I don't, I, yeah, right. There's no financial. Oh, there's, yeah. yeah, there's nothing. Okay, well, I don't know. Transparently, and just oh, letting no, it. It's, it's good, <laughs> but it's you're. It's good. No secret. You're not getting anything out of it. It's no, uh, no, no. All... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Roll call vote for approval, 2206. Sounds right? Yes. David Alexander? Yes. Dominic Nelly? Yes. Was that me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was you. Just as a phone? Yes. That's unanimous. Okay, moving down the list. Resolution 22-07, a resolution to support a grant application with the native village of Cantwell for bike paths through the, for bike paths um, through the EDA ARPA program. I uh, move to approve resolution 22-07. Second that. It's been moved by Mr. Shreve and seconded. Any discussion on the 22-07? Hearing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Jeff Stanger? Yes. Alan Street? Yes. David Alexander? Yes. Dominic Canelli? Yes. Paul? Yes. It's unanimous. All right. Resolution 22-08, a resolution by the Denali Borough Assembly identifying the state of Alaska's capital budget requests 
identifying our state of whatever capital budget request for the fiscal year 2023. I move to approve resolution 22 08. Second that. Been moved by Mr. Shreve and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Oh, actually, Mr. Mayor, would you like to do anything with this? Sure, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm reminded, thinking about the Cantwell bike paths that they put in for a capital budget request um, back in 2006 for those bike paths. Uh, it wasn't funded by the legislature and maybe it can be by through the ARPA and EDA. Um, and thanks for your support of that. So it's a process where you put in for capital budget requests and these days they're not funding a whole lot of these and so we've been asking for some pretty modest um, projects but needed projects that are public safety minded and um, certainly backup power at Tri-Valley School um, fits that bill in terms of um, a safe life and safety priority as the school does serve as an emergency evacuation location and the current backup generator there is over 40 years old. They, they do struggle or it's almost impossible to find replacement parts. And um, it, it, it definitely needs replacement. It's been on um, our CIP list. And this, this, this project's also on the state major maintenance um, project list, the one they're not funding right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're not funding it this way. How about this way? Um, now, the project on the CIP list is backup generators at all three schools. Um, but one at Tri-Valley is the one that has, has failed in its last call to duty. And uh, of course, it is the largest community with potentially, you know, the largest issue should, should there be uh, the need for evacuation for shelter there. Um, it could house the most people in terms of shelter is what I mean to say there. So, um, so it's the one project that, that, I, that we're, that we're as a priority, $50,000 doesn't do it. Doesn't get you the uh, replacement of the same generator. It, uh, speaking with both, both superintendent Polta and Curtis Hamill, the, the facilities director, they have an idea that they can come at uh, an even better replacement method of bringing in um, a connex that's a, an entire unit ready to go at about half the price of replacing the unit in the building and they free up that building space as well. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is going a little too in depth for you right now, but the, the state <laughs> won't fund the connex because that would be increasing the footage of the school, the facilities, which they won't do. So they won't do the cheaper, better way to do it. Um, and um, through, their, through their major maintenance program, but through a direct legislative appropriation as possible. So, um, so again, 50,000 isn't the total cost, um, but that 50,000 sum is also the sum at which the state does not require reporting and historically the last few, you know the state has been more amenable to fund projects to that level um at, of course less money and it's less work on their part so it's asking for a portion a small portion actually of the project which is a total of two hundred fifty thousand dollars an important project yeah. Uh, or am I to understand that there's no power backup now at Tri Valley? There is a backup generator which is over 40 years old, and there is a newer transfer switch. Um, but um, the generator, uh, when I said it, it, it failed its last call to duty, um, <clears throat> they they since repaired that, but it's it's. It's not that reliable, Jeff, right now. It's really not. There is a generator, so not that reliable. Is, is the other option something that we could fund, the borough could fund, and, and try to get reimbursement down the road from the state? Well, that reimbursement down the road is through the 
is through that program that we've been talking about that isn't being funded and the school district applies for. Um, but um, I mean, this is a pretty important piece that's needed. Is it possible that as the, the borough provide the funds for the Connex style generator and forego the state? It is possible. And it, we have identified it as a priority. And, you know, we do think the state should be a partner in the project. And we're asking for a, a, a minority share <laughs> of the project. Um, I, I, I just think it's a pretty big priority. And that's something we shouldn't be waiting too, too long for. And if the Connex approach is easier and more feasible i think we ought to just do that ourselves you know i that's up to whether we have the funds to do that but i think with this with the the scope of this or the importance of this it's something that we shouldn't just wait around on i hear you i uh, can't call myself but um what we did, we were working at one point, I think Mr. Noel was through uh, emergency, the, his emergency planning committee and stuff. Did that just kind of fizzle out with the funding like everything else kind of did or? Yeah, the pre-disaster mitigation pro program. So we did identify the generators, we right? We did identify these generators and we did hold out some hope that that um, they could be funded through through that program. And it, that was a, a state or federal program uh, combination. Yeah. yeah, federal money, state managed, like a lot of these uh, emergency um, funding is. So, um, so yeah, we did we did uh, have uh, hope that it could be funded that way, and it does it doesn't look like that's the case right now. Um, just in the sense of this resolution, would it? benefit us in any way to say we have tried different ways to get this kind of thing in this resolution like you know we went through the major school maintenance we tried through the local emergency plan now we're here for you know 10 percent of whatever it's going to cost us to do i don't know if that adds any weight into something but if we're here now to amend it maybe or because or does this one we can wait until next month for this one i don't know but I, and if not, just say no. I should. Just... Yeah, the CAPSIS deadline is uh, prior to our next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but those messages can be can be sent, you know, sure. verbally written. Okay. Um, this, this doesn't have to, won't be the only document, right? Okay. Well, I was just trying to open the box a little bit, you know. Um, okay. Any other uh, comments, questions about 22-08? Hearing none, I will ask for a roll call vote of approval. Okay, Tom Streets. Yes. Tom McNally. Yes. Jeff Stanger. Yes. David Alexander. Yes. And Chris Wizapol. Yes. Unanimous. All right, that moves us into other business. Do I do this? Buy a point seat? Is that what I need to do? Uh, Purchase. So you guys are going to appoint it. So the mayor recommends it. Yeah. Okay, so confirm. we're voting to confirm. Yeah. Vote, roll call. Huh? Roll call. Okay. okay, so sorry, I had to brief myself there. Appointment of the Planning Commission seat B to Mr. Steve Jones and the seat G for Ms. Susan Braun has been recommended by the mayor to us. Um, would you like a moment to go ahead, Mr. Mayor? Thank you. Each year, three, uh, three Planning Commission seats do come open and we did post uh, the availability of this opportunity to serve the planning commission throughout the borough, as we do have vacancies in, in a Cantwell and a, and a Northern seat, as well as these three more central seats um, coming open uh, for appointment 
And it was a little disappointing to not receive any interest, zero. So um, at the same, pardon me, from new people, zero interest from new. <laughs> it's like, wait, what happened to the planning commission? commission? <laughs> pardon me. But it was very heartening to receive interest from our existing serving commissioners. Thank you, Steve Jones. Thank you, Susan Braun, for your continued commitment to the planning commission um, and to the development of the borough. And the third seat is Eric Haugen's seat, and he he will be uh, recommended for appointment at next month's meeting. We just hadn't had that communication prior to the agenda. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're heartened also to have uh, Mr. Haugen's continued commitment to the commission. But that also leaves two vacancies still. And one in Cantwell, I just want everybody to know it, uh, we've got that opportunity to serve, to serve um, the borough, to serve the planning commission from uh, district one and um, we're the, the Cantwell seat and the Northern district as well. Um, so we'll continue to um, seek commissioners from those areas and as well as um, reappoint uh, Mr. Jones and Ms. Braun. Okay. Um, any comments on the appointment? Hearing none, I would ask for a show of hands to approve the mayor's recommendation for Mr. Jones and Mrs. Braun. I move to approve. Oh, that. Uh, the second best. God. <laughs> <laughs> Almost done. Okay. Uh, it's been moved to approve the appointments by Mr. Shreve. You can beat him one of these times. <laughs> I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Canale. Uh, now we'll ask for the show of hands in regards for approval. My hands up. Thank you, Mr. Stanger. Um, okay. <laughs> that takes us to item number two under other business, which is a list of liquor licenses. Can we just do them all at once? You can. Does anybody, well, does anybody I can't do any, it. No, but does anybody have any questions about any of them? We get to make a motion to approve it. First. I move to approve all or to not protest yes. all of the liquor licenses that we have to renew. Second that motion. Okay, it's been uh, moved to not protest the list on our agenda tonight. Um, are there any concerns, comments, questions, um, rumors, or otherwise to discuss <laughs> at this point? Okay, hearing none, I would like a show of hands for non protesting. Mr. Stanger. Hands up. All right. That takes us down to public comments. Um, the public here uh, has, has vacated, and I would look to the clerk to see if we've had any uh, communications during our meeting. Okay, that will move on from there. That takes us to the assembly comments. And we will start in the north with Mr. Stanger. All right. Um, had a great meeting. Um, really appreciate all the input. And uh, the, the took away a lot from this meeting, um, all the financials and all. And along with that, uh, I want to hit that generator issue again. I, I think this isn't something we can kick down the road. We're in the middle of winter. And we've had some pretty crappy weather. And it's been a tough winter. If that generator isn't reliable, we need to replace it. And if we got to replace it ourselves, we should do it. So I fully support something along that line. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Stanger. Uh, thank you for the great meeting. Thank you for the patience as uh, Mr. Zimmerman is truly only absent a handful of times every year, if maybe only two. And so I'm always rusty when it comes to being on this end of the gavel. Um, so I appreciate that. I appreciate the comments. I always love the information. I can't believe Mrs. Geek. 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 Let me mispronounce her name wrong so many times. But this is okay. Um, you know, it, it's not an easy job or, you know, service that we do at the, at this level and it can be taxing. So I do appreciate each and every one of you for continuing, um, the planning commissioners as well. The school board as well. These are these are very um, priceless positions that are being held in our community. And so, continue up the good work, everybody, and stay safe. 
through the rest of this month because I hear it's going to be a doozy. Mr. Shreve. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on Zoom and the, the public that did come in to voice their comments. Um, and I feel very fortunate to be uh, in the Denali borough, especially on the financial side of things with all the work that the employees do to be able to get it to where we don't hardly ever have to have any more audit work done than we need. And it is... Um, it's something that usually doesn't happen. I know there's a lot of people out there that have to do a lot more than what we do. So the crew here does really good work to be able to not have any, any extra work that needs to be done. Um, and I look forward to getting back into our finance committee meetings and being able to really get, dig into the next uh, fiscal year and see what we have going on and how we can work with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alexander. Uh, since it's my role, I'm going to second all those comments and say that Mr. Bone has done an excellent job <laughs> filling in for Mr. Zimmerman. And also, I would encourage people to attend that Zoom meeting on the Spruce Park Beetle. Um, I noticed that, you know, they sent some photos um, after the our loss of electricity and a number of them, the trees that were fallen onto the power lines were clearly um, dead beetle killed trees. And so this is going to be a problem that will continue and um, it's good for everyone to be as educated as possible about it. Is that it? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Mr. Canale, wrap us up, send us home. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, for those comments regarding uh, beetle killed trees. Couldn't uh, agree more. Um, thank you, Ms. Sapone, for uh, presiding over our meeting. Great meeting. Um, and also uh, for members of the uh, borough, uh, the public who did offer comments this evening. Thank you for that. Very much appreciate it. Um, as well as a thank you to Steve Jones, Susan Braun for continuing their service to the borough by surveying another term on a planning uh, commission, much appreciated. Other than that, concur with Jeff uh, Stinger regarding, uh, you know, staying safe and let's get through the second half of winter. First half has been certainly challenging throughout the borough. So that's all I have. Great, thank you. That brings us to the time and place of our next meeting. Um, first on the list, which isn't on your agenda is February 2nd for the joint work session with the school board and the administration staff of the district. Uh, put that on your calendar. It is a good meeting to attend, especially if you're wanting to understand more how the borough and the school district relate to one another. Um, always a good time. I think there's always sandwiches or something. Just kidding. Date and menu to be decided. <laughs> is there a time for that? Right. Probably six o'clock, if okay. I were to guess. Yes, the time, though, is it, right? Six o'clock. Right. But location to be determined. Stag, yeah, stag that on. It's the week before our next regular meeting, which is the next meeting, uh, Wednesday, February 9th. Regular meeting at six on the hybrid method that we've chosen here. With that being said, I would entertain. Oh, you didn't even let me finish. <laughs> he can't do it. I move to adjourn. I'll second. All right. <laughs> Meeting is ended. Thank you, guys. All right. Good thank job, you. Krista. Yeah. Good job, Krista.